Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the SD-161 Special Board of Education meeting. It's so nice to see everyone here today. I'd like to officially call the meeting to order at 614. Roll call, please. Nelson? Here. 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 Liz. Here. 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 And a quorum. Here. Yes, you're good to go. A quorum is present. Uh, the first item on the agenda is uh, audience comments, and we have several audience comments this evening. Um, I just want to remind you of uh, policy for comments. We allow 20 minutes um, for audience comments, five minutes per person. We have several. Um, people tonight, so we're excited to hear what everyone has to say, but we also reserve the right to shorten or move things along if necessary. We're also excited for um, to be able to celebrate our spelling bee participants, so i um, excited to have everyone here. The first person on the list for comments is Chuck Derringer. Thank you. I know most of you are here because of the, maybe the stormwater issue. I came to this community 50 years ago for the speed school. It was destroyed by flooding. So stormwater is a pretty serious issue. Hopefully your homes aren't too close to those floodplains. But there's a tool that our kids should be using in school developed by the University of Illinois because Governor State sent me down there for training which supported my activities here to solve the flooding over there. And it's called the Resource Management Mapping Service. I, it's, this is the, you, uh, the URS. It's rmms.illinois.edu. There's a tutorial that shows you how to use it, but you can see where all the floodplains are in the whole state of Illinois. Hopefully not too near your house, but you'll have a better understanding when your neighbor wants to move and didn't tell you why. Anyway, I know it's an important topic, and I think our technology is much better now. 50 years ago, we built that school in the wrong place, but we're doing much better to have it, I think. We should have some confidence in the engineers. I retired from MWRD. I was in charge of stormwater maintenance for several years, and it's gotten a lot better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll hear from Ashley Giddens. Good, good evening, members of the school board. My name is Ashley Giddens a concerned parent, resident, and community member of Heather Hill. I am here to address a matter that is of great importance to the community, the proposed placement of a 12-foot detention basin in close proximity to the playground at Heather Hill Elementary School. You may receive information from the village that does not contain the full list of concerns from Heather Hill residents. However, I will mention them this evening. First, I wanna emphasize that my primary concern is the safety and well-being of the children. Placing a 12-foot detention basin, which is an attractive nuisance, near the playground poses several significant risks that we cannot ignore. Detention basins are hazardous, especially for young children. When filled with water, they pose a drowning risk. Even with fencing or other safety measures, the risk remains, and we cannot afford to compromise on the safety of our children. Additionally, when the basin is dry, a child can fall, leading to serious injuries, possibly fatal. You may receive information stating that the village met with the community. However, this information does not mention that the residents of Heather Hill requested the meeting due to a lack of community engagement and input in the decision-making process. I believe that a significant project, especially one near an elementary school, should have involved transparent communication and collaboration with the affected community members from the start. The village held meetings about the Berry Lane project, but they did not mention the second phase consisting of a 12-foot detention basin near the playground. Instead, they stated that the basin would be behind Heather Hill. Furthermore, the construction would take place during the summer and could last until the school year. During the construction phase, kids could get into the area and get injured. Secondly, there are health concerns and an environmental impact to the quality of our drinking water. When meeting with the village and the engineers, the engineers confirmed that there may be an increase in deer, coyotes, foxes, and other predatory animals near the playground in school. 
This could lead to an increase in illnesses and wildlife encounters, affecting our children, adop adults, and beloved pets. Detention basins can become breeding grounds for mosquitoes and other pests, increasing the risk of vector-borne diseases. This is a serious concern for the health of our children in the broader community. Lastly, the presence of a detention basin could detect, detract from the aesthetic appeal of the school grounds and the property value of the neighborhood. This could make it difficult to attract potential residents to the area, potentially reducing the student population at the school. <laughs> Additionally, it may cause current home, um, homeowners to lose equity in their property, creating an inequitable and disproportionate impact on the Heather Hill community. There are alternative solutions available that would mitigate flooding risk without placing the basin near the playground. This project is the second phase of the Berry Lane project intended to address the 100 year rainfall needs for flooding at the Viaduct and Civic Center. However, the proposed 12 foot basin near the playground at Heather Hill only meets the 10 year requirement and there will still be flooding at the Viaduct. By placing the 12-foot basin near the playground at Heather Hill, the village is essentially spending $8 million to put a Band-Aid on the issue and putting our children in harm's way. In conclusion, I urge the school board to reconsider the placement of the detention basin near our elementary school. Our children's safety and well-being should always be our top priority, and we must do everything in our power to protect them. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll hear from uh, Crystal Quaggett. Good morning, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm yeah, still coming back. from work. My Hello. apologies. <laughs> so I live kitty corner to the tennis court. And so finding out the information was in 2021. I've only been a Heather Hill resident and Flossmore resident since 2020. I can honestly say that had the basin been of concern or that had actually already been implemented, that would not be the location that I would have chosen my home. Um, I do have children who go to the school. I don't want to see a fence. I look at it as great for protection, but in all honesty, it is not only an eyesore, I get it for protection, but why are we protecting our children in this manner? The first member mentioned that about technology. Why, I keep hearing that yes, something can be done, but we're talking about money. If this is something that, as Ashley mentioned, is still going to need changes in 10 years, then why are we not looking at other avenues in which to get those financial resources? I was not under the, imp I was not under the impression that this would be to the extent it is. I was not considered. I know some of my other neighbors weren't considered. I really wish it would have been information that would have been provided to me sooner where we would have been able to have a vote. I believe that now, finally, that we're in this place to actually be able to say something, I really do hope that everyone is considering the parents with the children. It's not just about the flooding. More than just the businesses are being affected by this. And we're still talking about $8 million. So what else can we put that $8 million towards? Can it continue to add on to further um, gather more grant money for this source? It's not doing the immediate ratification where there's going to be absolutely no flooding. So I'm just asking that we really take this into consideration. If you have seen the markers, the markers, I think, made it worse for me to see it recently as how big this detention basin is going to be. We're talking about kids going to school throughout the year, but what about after school when they're playing? What about after school, after school hours? What about in the summertime when they're at the basketball court? We talk about school being safe in the new playground that's on the opposite side. Now, right next to that playground, we're going to put this detention basin. It just doesn't seem fair to the kids. I understand the reason for helping with the flooding, but it's not making it go away. So can we identify a better formable decision in regards to this? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Monique Mansker. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. 
As you said, my name is Monique Mansker, and I was once the um, business owner in downtown Flossmore, and I am no, no longer there because of the flooding issues that I experienced over, over three times while I was there. And I saw some pictures uh, earlier, and I was asked to come and share my testimony, what I experienced. And because the first time it was not as bad, but I was there when it, it hit about five feet in my business. And because of that, and then COVID hit, but prior to that, I was al already considering giving up the place because I had so many issues with the, um, the flooding. And then it, with it being a no flood zone, I was responsibility for the, uh, I was responsible for any damage that I experienced. So I, my heart goes out to the residents of the, in, uh, the community, but I also wanted to share uh, the, um, the agony of being a business owner in the community and having to pay for the damage myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we'll, we will hear from Sandy Byron. Dr. Smith, hi. Um, I live across, Sandy Byron, I live across from Heather Hill School, so I see the activities of everybody and the kids. My concern is, this is my fourth or fifth presentation about the retention pond I'm out there behind the school every single day with my dog. It is mapped out, it is flagged. I think if the parents from Heather Hill School saw the extent, Ashley pointed it out, the extent of the area that's being considered. And I just, I, I'm happy for the turnout tonight. Um, this has been a proposal for over a year now and now the parents are finally waking up out of consideration for the safety of the kids, which I am also very concerned about. I'm concerned about the traffic while the construction goes on because the traffic and the parents getting to and from school to think that Lawrence Crescent would be completed in the summer's time for the buses and all the other traffic there. But I'm glad to see the community's support. I wish that the village had been a little more transparent with the residents of Heather Hill in particular about laying out other alternative plans because I really think this is a little bit excessive. So I ask for support and your consideration to maybe find another viable solution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we will hear from John Yast. Yast, sorry, John Yast. Thanks. Hi, I'm John Yace. I live at 1430 Lawrence Crescent, right across the street from the proposed big dig retention area. Uh, the village of Lossmore has been working with engineers for the past several years on a knee-jerk reaction to a rain event that can be expected to occur every hundred years or so. In 2019, we were hit by what was then considered a hundred-year rain. The viaduct was impassable, the intersection was inundated and the Civic Center building doors were pushed in, flooding the basement and causing extensive interior damage to the building and its commercial tenants, the heartbeat of downtown Flossmoor. Since then, the village has been working on plans to eliminate this possibility, while the owner of the building has taken no visible measures to protect his tenants. Flood doors and flood-proof glass are widely available and highly secure but there are no flood doors in that building. Meanwhile, the village and its engineers, the same ones who brought us the no parking poles downtown, so people don't park there, they just double park there, has concocted an $8 million plan to protect the Civic Center building and its tenants. The village recently held an open house for the public, which was the first time many residents heard about the project. And in reaction, after the open house, uh, we had a nice Zoom meeting a few weeks ago. One of the things I learned that evening 
is that whenever the viaduct becomes impassable, it remains that way for only three or four hours. Now, since 2000, it has become impassable seven times, or roughly once every three or four years. So viaduct flooding is much more common than civic center flooding. So roughly every three or four years, the viaduct is closed for three or four hours. And now the village wants to spend $8 million to eliminate this scourge. To accomplish this feat, traffic through the viaduct will be impacted for up to two months to avoid a potential four-hour closure. Sterling Avenue and Lawrence Crescent, the primary arteries for Heather Hill School traffic will be torn up for months. But most egregiously, the water from the viaduct will be redirected to the retention basin barely 50 feet from an elementary school. Although the engineers say the basin is perfectly safe, they're also perfectly willing to put a big fence around the entire project. And then to put a little lipstick on that pig, they say there will be educational signs about the plants and animals inside the fence. A true look but do not touch educational experience. The village needs the cooperation of the school district and the park district and I'm here to ask you to withhold your cooperation. As a resident, I'm not looking forward to seeing a big no trespassing pit across the street, but even less enthusiastic about looking at some huge fence. While digging up the tennis courts is the least expensive option, should that be the primary consideration? Had the affected building owner taken any measures himself, I might have more sympathy, but I don't see why it's the village responsibility if the owner doesn't try to mitigate the damage. Please tell the village that the safety of our kids is more important than cost. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Devin Gibbs. Good evening, all. Good evening. Good evening. I appreciate all of the comments for the speakers who came before me. I didn't come with any prepared mark, remarks for tonight, but to register that I am in opposition of the location of the detention pond. I share many of the same concerns that have already been communicated by my fellow neighbors. I am a parent of children who go to the school. I am a new resident to the neighborhood. We've only lived there about a year and a half now. And um, when I saw, when I first heard of this, I was concerned. But as I've seen more imagery and the staking out at the school as well, the, it's, it's such a huge, huge footprint that they're talking about. Um, taking up from the school, taking away. I share the same sentiments about the concerns with the fence. It is an eyesore. Uh, I'm not in favor of putting up bars around our kids' school. They have a nice open field now to play, to run, to feel free. The kids play in the playground during the school year. When we're out of school and after school, our tennis court is used throughout the day by various people, adults, children. They have tennis lessons there. Um, and I just wish the village had done, it seemed like it wasn't an inclusive process in terms of coming up with the solution. It seemed like they kind of already figured out what they wanted to do. And while they have invited residents to, to give their comments and feedback on it, I really haven't seen many other uh, alternatives that have been raised, but I may have been just late to this conversation, so I apologize if that information was shared before. But again, I uh, won't take up any more time, but I appreciate you all allowing us the opportunity to voice our concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there are no other audience comments, and so now we will move to the recognition of the 161 Spelling Bee participants. Good evening, Board of Education, families, and friends and guests of School District 161. My name is Sandy Thompson, and I have the honor and privilege to recognize our scholars um, that have quite a talent for spelling. Our spelling bee begins at the elementary level in December, in which we have um, approximately 18 to 20 students, maybe, per, per uh, elementary school. 
um, try out for their B, and we end up with two representatives that uh, move on to our district-wide B, which was held uh, in February, this end of January this year, excuse me. And so we would like to recognize those scholars that have been practicing um, a very extensive list of 400 some odd words and many different languages and um, cultures and things like that um, to be recognized in their accomplishments. We had 14 students um, participate in our District B. They went 11 rounds in over an hour and a half. <laughs> Um, they, um, you know, did a wonderful job, um, and I'd like to recognize everyone, um, including our second runner-up and then our first place champion um, that spelled the word Trinidadian. Trinidadian was our winning word. This year. Okay. That's right. Um, Just no call it out. specific order, but we if you are that. here, please come forward so we can recognize you. Connor Boyko. Sophia Braseno. <laughs> LaRue Fitch, Jr. <laughs> Lauren Hughes. Naya Kitling, Uche Okafor, Aubrey Phillips, Simon Reyes, Austin Smith, Chase Steverson, Deontay Sworn, Aiden Turner, Dahlia Thomas, who was our second runner-up. And then our champion of our District 161 Spelling Bee this year, Nyla Whittier, fifth grade at Flossible Hill School. Congratulations again. You all set? I think so, yeah. All right, the next item on the agenda uh, is the superintendent's report. Yes, and I'll keep my comments brief because I know we have some important presentations to get to tonight, but I certainly want to welcome everyone uh, to our Board of Education meeting tonight. You're always welcome, even though we may not have topics that are uh, as controversial as the, the ten detention basis, but certainly we welcome all of you tonight. We're in ramp up time for uh, the school year, certainly as we get further past winter break, our events are uh, picking up. We have a number of activities specifically this week, including our uh, pre-kindergarten family night, which is tomorrow night in this building at six o'clock. So if you have a child who's in our pre-K program or you'd like to learn more about it, please join us at Normandy Villa tomorrow at six o'clock. On Wednesday at Western Avenue School, we're hosting a math night at 6 o'clock. And then on Thursday, we have Serena Hills with a third grade concert at 6.30 p.m. So a number of opportunities to see our great students in action this week. We have several next week as well, but I do want to draw everyone's attention to one specific event uh, that will impact a lot of you. Uh, we have kindergarten registration night. That's on Wednesday, February 28th. That's from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at each of our schools. Parents will receive information just about kindergarten, specifically our portrait of a graduate, so you know what we expect, conversations around the importance of 
attending school on a daily basis and what that means as you start to miss days and those kind of stack up for your child's future. So we're really looking forward to that event. Uh, always ready to welcome our new crop of students and kindergarten uh, will be no uh, exception to that. At tonight's meeting, if you're willing to stick around, uh, we're going to hear from our building principals and school leaders regarding our mid-year school improvement plan updates and our updated data measures. The hard work of our students, teachers, and administrators is certainly evident in our data. And this is a perfect opportunity for our building leaders to share the work that's been done to this point, the data that we've received, and any course corrections between now and the end of the school year. It's really important that we use very sensitive measures to look at how our students are progressing, because then we have an opportunity to make changes now. We certainly don't want to wait um, until the end of the year to have those conversations. So I'm really looking forward to the presentations tonight. I know there's really great information that's going to be shared. Uh, this is only a mid-year update. Our full data update with fall to winter measures, growth scores, standard deviations, et cetera, will be shared after the conclusion of the school year when we have our spring data sets finalized, including our state data, state data sets. So we're excited about tonight, but this is just a midway point check-in on our work throughout the school year. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, so we'll move on to the discussion items. And the first discussion item is uh, the Village of Flossmore Detention Basin. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bridget Wachtel. I'm the village manager in Flossmoor. Thank you so much uh, for having us this evening. Um, I have with me this evening uh, John Brunke, our public works director, uh, as well as Corey Van Dyke. He's with Baxter and Woodman Engineering, uh, who is the consulting engineer for this project. Also in attendance is our village attorney, Kathy Orr, and Doug Bohm from the Park District is here as well. We have been working on this project and meeting in public meetings about this project since 2020. And uh, we most recently were before you uh, in May of 2023. So uh, we're glad to be back again to be representing this project and giving you an update. Severity of storm events is a real threat to property, especially in older communities with older infrastructure. At 100 years old, Flossmoor has experienced that firsthand. Tonight we are going to share with you the second phase of the Flossmoor Viaduct project. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the first phase were the improvements on Barry Lane. And the second phase will have a positive impact on both the Heather Hill neighborhood as well as the central business district. The project really has three main goals. The first being able to maintain access for public safety between the east and west end of the village. The second goal is to protect our local economy. Businesses have left because of the flooding and loss, and you heard from one business here this evening. A viable business community positively impacts property values and the desirability of the community. And third, the third goal is to protect residential property in the Heather Hill neighborhood. This phase of the project will enhance the improvements on Barry Lane. Flood mitigation will enhance private property values. In addition, as you hear the presentation tonight, we believe this project is an improvement to the neighborhood and even addresses some grading issues at the school itself. Uh, I'm going to turn the microphone over to John Brunke and Corey, who's going to walk through uh, a presentation for you this evening. Uh, I will then wrap up the discussion. And we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. I know included in your packet is a copy of the drafted intergovernmental agreement for consideration. I know that won't be voted on here this evening, uh, but we'd be happy to answer any questions on that as well. well thank you, Bridget. Uh, as Bridget said, I'm John Brunke, Public Works Director for the Village of Flossmoor. Um, back in May when we came to visit with you and uh, present this project, uh, at that time, uh, a lot of these slides are the same as that, so we kind of kept them in there for uh, kind of a review for the most part and kind of they're good pictures and good evidence of what the real issue is here at the viaduct. As you can see, uh, these are some old pictures from 1928 and 1951 of flooding in the viaduct. Um, the viaduct was built in the 20s. As you can see, it's been a problem since it's been constructed and has not gotten better with the in influx and increase of our storm events we've had over the years. Uh, rainfall intensities have increased. Uh, rainfall numbers have increased. Um, the Illinois State Water Survey has increased 
their uh, rainfall data to Bolton 75 uh, because of that. Uh, rainfall is not getting less, it's getting more, more intense and more often. Uh, so really the time is now to make this uh, problem uh, a reality and fix it. Um, here's some more current pictures. Um, the picture on the right is from 2019, uh, showing the downtown business district. Um, as you can see, the intersection is completely flooded, and that was a storm that actually blew those doors in at the old Colwell Banker uh, office on the corner. Uh, water got to be, I believe, 12 to 15 inches high at those doors. Um, nothing you could do to stop that. If it's going to flood that deep, it's going to go in the building and cause damage. Um, nothing, no easy way for that building owner to do anything to stop that from happening. Uh, the picture on the left is the viaduct, uh, obviously looking through it, another closure uh, with police uh, having to close down. It does stay closed typically on average, probably about three to four hours, sometimes less, because uh, we do have storm sewer there, but it's undersized. It's uh, probably original to the community when the viaduct was built itself. So uh, really undersized older storm sewer that uh, is way undersized for current day needs. Um, here's a picture of the Berry Lane in 2019. Uh, as you can see, Berry Lane um, is kind of a whole area. There's uh, three blocks there that would flood during rain events, undersized storm sewer. Uh, we, as part of this project and looking at the viaduct, we had Baxter Woman look at all the upstream areas to see what could be done in the Heather Hill area, in the north part of Flossmoor Road uh, by Parker Junior High. All those areas drain of the viaduct. And um, we wanted to look and see what we could do upstream to mitigate the flooding and not just try to deal with uh, um, at, as a field for at least for throughout the year. Um, so a, a lot of this blue area, the blue area is where the uh, proposed basin. Um, the system is designed to protect against a 10 year flood at the viaduct, at the Civic Center and at Berry Lane. In addition to all of this, it would solve uh, further problems upstream by accepting more water. Um, and that is an example of being a good neighbor. Okay, I don't know why the... All right. uh, here's, I've got a couple uh, visualization of what the basin would look like. Um, one thing to note here is that it is dry almost the entire year. Uh, it's holding water just following large storm events. Um, you can see an example of native plantings. Um, at the bottom of the basin, as well as uh, the fence that you've heard about. <coughs> Here's another view of it from street level. Um, this is looking south along Lawrence Crescent. Um, as I mentioned, the basin will be dry under normal conditions. What is shown here is the 10-year design storm. I think an important note is that larger storms than that will not appreciably increase the water level in the basin here. Uh, instead, the, the pipes convey what the 10-year storm is. So larger storms than that will hold more water at the viaduct or Berry Lane where water is already being held. And I want to point that out to uh, note that larger storm events will not increase this water and uh, um, put the school at further risk. Um, there's nine-hour drawdown, drawdown time for these storm events. That's the expectation that after less than half a day, the water will recede again. Um, here's another view of when the basin is full. Uh, I wanted to point out a couple uh, examples of local detention that we already have in the village. The one on the left is along Lawrence Crescent, just south of Heather Hill Elementary. The one on the right, I believe, is at the high school. Um, and I, I should mention that uh, retrofitting detention on school or at, at schools or parks is a very common uh, approach to dealing with stormwater uh, in developed communities like this throughout Chicagoland. Uh, here are another couple examples. These are not in Flossmoor, but additional uh, detention areas that uh, Baxter Movement has designed. You can see some signage there on the right. Uh, we've done Several of these in uh, North Shore suburbs, uh, Glenview, Winnetka, we're doing one in Wheeling. Um, and they're, like I've said, they're very common uh, from other engineering consultants all throughout uh, the Chicagoland area. 
sorry, it seems like every time I pull up a slide, half of the pictures come up, so I have to go back. Uh, here's, here's an example of some of the signage. This shows uh, some native plantings, uh, the flora on the right side there, and some of the fauna on the left for uh, um, animals, birds, butterflies that are typical to the region, not necessarily uh, typical to the specific native plants that would be installed. Um, another an example of educational signage would be describing what stormwater management is and why it's important and how it can benefit a community. Um, and, and that's another option for uh, educating um, community members or children, putting it outside of the, uh, outside of the basin. Um, and I will hand this back to John. So this is our last slide uh, for the presentation before we go to the Q&A. But uh, the left side is uh, some of the resident concerns that were shared with the village um, at our open house event through emails and also at a meeting we had virtually with the PTO of Heather Hill and Heather Hill residents. Uh, so some of the safety things that were brought up was, uh, you know, what's the safety of the basin? This is a drowning hazard. Um, Yes, you have water in a basin, that could happen, but this thing was gonna be dry the majority of the time, other than there was a storm event. We have uh, detention basins throughout the village. We have them next to a park in Highland, just south of the school. There's no fencing around any other basins in the village. They're very common. Um, obviously, you don't go in them when there's a storm, um, when they fill up. Um, some uh, Another thing was brought up was the fencing. Uh, that was actually added, obviously, for the school request from our May meeting. That was something the board uh, wanted to see. Obviously, uh, that's the uh, school's decision if this is approved because this is your property and this is uh, your school here. Um, like, I, like I said, a lot of detention basins don't have fencing, but if you would like a fencer to kind of just have a barrier to keep the children away from it, it's not a bad idea. We'd be happy to add that to the design. Uh, the basin has uh, pretty minor side slopes. It's nothing, there's no drop-offs or anything that anybody could fall in or slide into. Uh, you could walk down in the bottom of this and walk back out. Um, I'm sure many of you, if you've been out, walk around some other basins, you'll you kind of picture what that looks like. Um, some of the signage that we uh, said came up in some of our meetings, it was a concern, uh, putting safety signage to keep away from the basin. Um, obviously, we would... Uh, do that as a collaborative effort with the school and the residents. What kind of wording would you like to see? What, um, what you know, where would you want the signs on the fence? Th uh, things of that nature. Um, I think that's a good idea, but I think it'd be done in good taste as well. Um, emergency access. Um, there will be a two gates at either end of this as proposed, but they would be locked at all times. Um, only public works would have a key for it and police and fire. Uh, that would be to let us in for maintenance but also to let uh, utility companies in because uh, ComEd does have to get along the railroad right away. So we can't uh, keep them from getting to their power poles back there. Around the top of the basin, around about, I'd say about 80% of it, there'll be a 10 to 12 foot um, grass, mold grass path that uh, you can drive a truck around, a pickup truck or a utility truck. Um, that will be mowed by our contractors as proposed. Um, we also will uh, trim both sides of the fence and mow the grass along the fence around the whole basin. So. You won't have weeds growing through the fence. Um, that wouldn't be acceptable to us either. We will not want to see that. So that's something we would take care of with our um, landscape contractors. Uh, prescribed burns. The one way of maintaining these natural basins, which are really good for the environment, um, is to burn them every three years. Bring in a professional company. We do it on the Highland Basin just south of Heather Hill School. It's usually done in the fall or the spring or the winter when conditions are cold, wet, and non-growing season. Uh, that burns all the weeds out and then it lets all the native plants come back up and reestablish and uh, take, uh, take control back from the weeds, basically. That's how you keep a lot of the um, invasive species out that would uh, take over an area and make it unsightly. Um, mosquitoes, uh, that was a concern as well. Uh, this basin is going to be dry most of the time, other than when there's a storm event and it drains out in nine hours. If there's no standing water, mosquitoes really shouldn't be an issue in there. Uh, so that's something to note. And then the tennis courts was uh, one of the bigger uh, uh, things we heard about. And we obviously talked to the HF Park District and Doug Sir this evening, um, if you want to have any questions for him later. But they did commit to replacing the tennis courts and the park uh, and, and to the south of the school in Highland Park there. So, or a variation of it, I guess. So, and with that, I'll hand it over to Bridget to talk about the other portion. Uh, John covered a lot of the 
information on this slide, I just want to emphasize our commitment to continuing to collaborate with the district throughout the final design of this project. As John mentioned, um, it's not going that. Um, we've proposed uh, a six-foot wrought iron style fence, uh, but, uh, but certainly we would welcome the district's um, input on that as we move forward, as well as on such matters as language of the signs, both for safety as well as for educational purposes. With respect to the plantings, um, once uh, the arborist has chosen um, the, the plantings for selection, we can go with more flowering plants or less flowering plants. So there's another area where we would welcome the district's um, input on that, on that matter. Um, with respect to traffic control during construction, um, this project is going to be phased. Um, the first phase ideally is the construction of the basin um, during the summer when the school's not in session. And ideally, we'd like to be able to do that this summer. Um, the other phases of the project, going down Lawrence and Sterling Avenue, and then ultimately some work that has to occur at the viaduct itself, um, I don't have the timing on those particular phases uh, tonight because, as Corey mentioned, we're still waiting on a couple pieces of funding to see if they come to fruition, and that will have an impact on, on that phasing. But with respect to traffic control, and I know it was brought up earlier by concerned residents, um, we will obviously be in communication with the district um, about any construction that's happening on the neighborhood streets. We'll be in communication with the residents as well. Uh, sensitive to trying to get buses and cars to and from school, the start and stop of, of school, et cetera. So uh, we'll continue to work with the district on that matter as well. As I mentioned at the um, beginning of the presentation, during the discussions that we've had with um, Dana and his staff, I know that there are some um, areas around the playgrounds at Heather Hill that are muddy, marshy. We can address those with some regrading during our construction uh, to, to improve those areas for the district. And then finally, as John mentioned, um, this will ultimately be some reduced maintenance for the district uh, because we are taking on the maintenance of the basin itself and that will be uh, our full responsibility. So with that, uh, that really concludes our formal presentation. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. Has the Park District formally committed to rebuilding the tennis courts at a different location? Sure. Doug, do you want to sure. come on up? Hello. Hi. My name is Doug Bohm. I'm the director of the HI Park District. Yes, we uh, recognize the importance of that asset at Heather Hill Park and plan to relocate it to the south, as Janet said, at Highlands Park, which is just south of the school. Thank you. Yep. Have you pinpointed exactly where? Because those are pretty active baseball fields in Highland. Yes, we've worked with, uh, we've, we've been in contact with Flossmoor Baseball. We've identified a, uh, an area, if you will, the very south field towards the outfield area, and they still believe that with the measurement of the courts and the fields, they could be able to do both. They could both exist. I had a question for Bridget. Um, so actually, I can't remember your name. Corey, Corey, you did speak to uh, having the Army Corps of Engineers and the two options that were given were, um, well, this was one. <laughs> there, was, there was really only this, right? This was the option. Um, because of the storm, it's an undersized storm sewer under the viaduct. Yes. Thing that I, I remember, and something that just in hearing you guys speak, it, it's so, one, and then you mentioned the good neighbor. So I'm, I'm thinking of one, who are your neighbors and municipalities, and have we spoken with them on ulterior ways uh, to mitigate that undersized storm sewer and, and having, and I'm not, I am not an engineer, so I don't know which way water is flowing, and I obviously know it's coming down under the viaduct. So I'm just wanting to make sure that we've uh, if we're being, we're being good neighbors, the village, have we talked with our neighbors in other municipalities? Yeah, I, I can touch on some of that and then you can. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the point about being a good neighbor, and I, I'm sorry that half of the words pop up sometimes and half of them don't. Um, 
Uh, that's not, that was not necessarily uh, towards other municipalities. Okay. That was more by taking away the water at these couple locations that will improve uh, flooding elsewhere in the municipality, in Flossmore. Flossmore proper, yes. not in the region of, okay. That's correct. That's helpful. Okay. Um, so I do know that Butterfield Creek does, although, flow through other municipalities. So once again, I have nothing to do with any water reclamation, anything. So I'm learning here too. Um, the creek cannot support the amount of water, correct? It's not like we could open up or flow more water into it. There's no widening of it, digging, making it deeper. There's like the creek is a non-option. You have addressed, you've looked into that. It, there's just cannot, because I know it flows into Thorn Creek into Chicago Heights, which I know, um, I live in Chicago Heights, and Chicago Heights did actually widen areas of the creek in and around the Bloom High School campus. So I know they've taken measures to mitigate some flooding in that area. So I'm just making sure that you guys have checked those boxes. Yeah, I appreciate that. We, we have looked into that, and uh, it, it does not mitigate the flooding. Um, so th this water will still get to Butterfield Creek, but uh, after it's held in the detention area, and then it will drain down and then go in the existing pipe that goes under, there's kind of a dotted gray line right. that goes under the, the railroad right of way towards Butterfield. So it slows that. Yes. So yeah. Butterfield can continue to naturally drain. Yep. How deep is the empty basin? Uh, about 12 feet deep. I've seen many a municipality uh, in this and out of state that have these basins, um, fenced, not fenced, playgrounds in half of them, and <laughs> big center uh, storm drains that are, you know, um, and, you know, the, its safety is always, I know, as far as my, uh, oh, this entire board, I, also, I know I can speak for. It's definitely utmost safety uh, for our kids. Um, so there's a lot to consider here. I, I know I can speak for myself, but um, we want to be cognizant of the residents and the flooding issues that are in you know, people's backyards as well. So, um, In the 100-year uh, storm scenario, get eight or nine inch rain. So we're still going to have flooding on the viaduct in that scenario, correct? That's correct. Is that flooding going to reach the businesses on the other side of the street? Uh, we the, the results that we have uh, indicate that the flooding for the 100 year is mitigated um, some, but not significantly. I imagine it still could reach the businesses uh, for the 100 year storm, uh, but for 10 year, 25 year, 50 year, it is significantly reduced. Well, so the, the storm or storms that recently reached those businesses were those, how many inches of rain were those? Uh, those I don't know off. Were those both 100-year storms? Yeah, it was more than 100-year storm. Okay. I think our 100-year, 24-hour storm here is, I think, the end of So? Yeah, it depends on the intensity and the duration of the storm, so yeah. I can't nail it down super but easily. if the 100-year storm is the only thing that floods those businesses, and if this solution doesn't mitigate that problem, why are we doing this? The 100-year storm is not the only storm that would flood those businesses. Okay. What, when's the last time those businesses flooded when it wasn't eight or nine inches of rain? I don't have all of the historical background on that. Okay. So, um, my name is Rita Barnes. I am on, I'm the owner of Therapy Beauty and Wellness. I opened in 2020. Um, before I purchased my space, I uh, purchased the space from a woman named Monique uh, Sullivan. Um, I want to say she got, oh, she had the water in her space, and um, she lost her business. And then the business did it on the block, and they lost everything. Um, that, was, I guess, that was 2020. So what I'm asking is, I'm trying to understand, is that a 100-year event? Or or were there more floods? I mean, my, I, I don't recall seeing it flooded any other than, than 2020, but I'm, I could easily be forgetting something, so. so when I purchased my space after that, it flooded um, in 2020, and I want to say I had about eight inches. 
Um, it was the basement. So I'm uh, I'm drawing on it, but we use the basement often. She's next to uh, in Barry Lane. Um, do we have a, a assessment of how that's going to fare if we don't do this work? How will Barry Lane fare under a eight inch or nine inch rain? Uh, I have that information, but not with me. Um, so I could get back to you, um, but I can tell you that, like John attested to, the four inch rain, it's, it, it fared fine, as, and it would have quite a bit of flooding otherwise. I don't have the information with me now what the, how the 100 year would affect Barry Lane with or without the phase two. Well, I'm just trying to explore if, if the Barry Lane repairs that have been done already, improvements, are going to protect the residents on Barry Lane in a 100 year storm and without doing this. And if this doesn't actually protect the businesses in downtown from the 100 year storm, which I think is an odd phrase because everyone, <laughs> no one's more wrong than weathermen. So that 100 year storm probably happened four times in the next 100 years. But I'm not seeing the benefit of doing it if we're not, you know, if, unless we're improving the life for the Barry Lane residents or for the downtown residents, what you're telling me is that for the downtown businesses, we're not. That's, that's not what I'm trying to tell you, at least. Uh, the 100 year storm is not the only storm that damages the businesses or the residential areas. Right. So I would expect, though, you guys to be able to tell me exactly how many times those businesses have flooded in the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years. That would be pretty relevant to our decision, right? Can't sure. I, I don't have all of that historical information. Okay. They uh, said before that in a hundred year flood, it wouldn't reach the curve. Well, let's let's stop using the hundred year thing because I think it's. Let's. Can you tell me? Can you guys? We, we're not voting on this tonight. So no. We can you can come it. back to us with how many times those businesses have flooded for as long as you've got records and what the corresponding rainfall was? Can you do that? Sure. Okay. okay. If, if you prefer, you could say the 1% storm. That's more of a scientific way of saying it. It's not scientific because it's a black swan <laughs> problem. Because just you, you just, you, one of you just said, oh, we, we built it wrong 200 years ago. And oh, it rains more now, right? And so for all you know, it's going to rain more in the future. And so measuring, I, I, it's, you have no idea. We, we could have 400-year storms next year. Right. We don't know. So I just just the facts that we have, right? How many times have the, has the downtown area flooded um, basements or buildings? I'm interested um, to also know the viaduct too. Like I, that's, because if that's, that's also an impediment to emergency vehicles getting to the other side of. So that was gonna be my next question, right? Yeah, sure, that's, and that's, I wanted to know, like, can we add that into yeah. um, those numbers? If you have it, right? Uh, when it comes to the viaduct flooding, it's a much more serious um, public safety problem when the 183rd and Volmer viaducts are also flooded. Mm. It essentially, essentially makes it impossible for emergency services to get to either side of town. Not that it's great when it's just the one viaduct, but if you have it, it would be nice to have that other information as well. Yeah, just a, a couple of comments on the questions and we'll, we'll pull together as much data as that, that we have. Um, when it comes to the impact on private property, the, the data is only, only as good as what a private property owner has retained. So, you know, that's going to require us to go back and, and seek that information from the Civic Center owner and other property owners, try to gather that for you. Because of the intensity of rain and the um, uh, changes in rain patterns that we've experienced, the viaduct is no longer supporting even the 10-year construction. And that's the standard that engineers build toward. So we're trying to at least get to that standard. Would it be great to be able to, to cover a 100-year storm? Absolutely. It's that much more protection for all the property involved, including the public property. That option, which is, I think, um, to Christina's point about a couple of options being studied, that was probably our most 
other viable option, it doubles the cost of the project and we do not have a willing property owner to uh, work with us on detention, construction of detention. I'm not asking you to so. get to 100 years storm standard. I guess what I'm getting at is that it's what you, you have But even buries that tenure. You haven't convinced me that meeting the 10 year standard will actually make a meaningful day to day improvement in the lives of any resident or business owner. We're seeing that today with the improvements at Barry Lane. That was constructed to Those a 10 year standard. It hasn't flooded. And great. Correct. Yeah. I, I, that's great work. So, but you're not, you haven't told me that this is going to make any difference to the Barry Lane going forward or to the downtown business owners going forward. It's possible that Barry Lane doesn't flood and it's possible that while the viaduct floods, um, you know, it doesn't get to the businesses. Or, or, I'm sorry, it's possible that the viaduct flood is gonna get to the businesses anyway. So, I, that's what I'm not hearing is, this project will improve the lives of the Berry Lane residents or our downtown um, business owners. Sounds like we don't know. Or well, it's gonna provide tenure protection. I mean, that's the whole point. I, tenure protection isn't meaningful to me. Well, I need you to tell right me, we don't get to your are, you, are, are we going to have less floods of basements for the business owners I, with I this project? I don't know the weather is going to be any better than you're going to know it in it's the like next year. So it's like anybody, insurance. We know that the rainfall intensity has increased, rainfall numbers have increased. We're seeing it in, our, in town, everywhere, everybody has flooding in their yards. You know, it's, it's no secret. But, but if we, we have, have, it's your, but if we have, what we can afford to build to is the whole If we have four nine inch race falls next year, those business owners are going to flood, right? If they have. We could get a 20 inch rainfall next year. How are we playing for that? How are we going to vote for that? I mean, it's not my question. You got to answer it. Hold on. Hold on. I, we're not playing multiple hypotheticals here. My question is can you tell me that those businesses are not going to flood in a 9 inch rainfall? Not a 9 inch rainfall. It could probably they could get water in there. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that, that, so that if we don't know the answer to that. that we're not building until 100 years, we can't. We don't have a space for retention. Okay. So whatever inches you call a 10 year rain, they're not flooding now, right? Those businesses? Not, not necessarily. No. So this is where I go back to the, the question that you, that you asked previously okay. about getting information from the private property owners. Not every single time, I mean, uh, Marty Max, who you heard from earlier today, I know he wrote a letter of support for this project. Um, he's owned the Civic Center for more than 10 years at this point. Um, so every time he floods, he doesn't necessarily reach out to the village. Does he reach out to the village? Yes, but not every single time that he floods. So it I could like not. Sounds like should be able to get him to answer the question then. We'll certainly try. I mean, if he's not willing to answer the question, I'm not sure why the village. I'm not sure why I should care then. Um, with respect to funding for the project, can you put the slide with the funding numbers back up, please? So um, how much of the bond it would be going to this project? Approximately uh, half of it, five million. Okay. And or maybe less dependent if we get uh, additional grant funds that we're applying for right now. So that five million of the pursuing, if you get all of that, are you still spending bond money on the project? But um, no, we would put in the bond money for the street. Uh, bond was uh, approved to be half viaduct improvements, half street rehab. Right. So, so we've already done about two million we get for the viaduct. The more we can put towards street rehab. Extra five million dollars in funding. Well, it, it really depends on which other projects apply for that funding. It's it's hard to predict. What is CDS? Uh, congressional district set aside. And CPF? Uh, Committee project funding. So it's state or federal? Uh, that's all federal at the bottom, or except with that exception of uh, WRD, those last two million are federal. Hey, do you have any other questions? I have a couple questions. Are you, okay. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the benefits that you were describing, like um, the native plants, native flowers. 
We benefit as a district to provide to our students, like opportunities for them to learn. Benefit as a district to provide to our students, like opportunities for them to learn about native plants. And if so, when I look at slide 10, um, how would students have access if it's behind the gate? I'm not quite understanding that part. Well, the idea would be if you uh, put your class out there and talk about it. Okay, but they read, wouldn't yeah, actually be able to go in More of an like outdoor type it. classroom, which are become more common. Okay. Maybe not to the full extent of that, but that's... Okay. But they wouldn't be able to get... They in, wouldn't be able to get there. in. No, they wouldn't be able to get in there. It would be outside the fence. They okay. walk up to the fence, they could see it. Yeah, okay. It's not going to look terrible. It's going to look nice with the native plantings in there. I think we yeah, agree with that. Yeah, I understand that. Nice. Yeah. Um, then my other question is, how long will the playground be not usable during the construction? Like, how is that going to... Um, the playground probably just over the summer is our plan. We would build a basin as our proposed plan over the summer months. And then okay. I had a, additional questions that popped into my head. Can you remind us why the um, Barry Lane infrastructure cannot be used in this area? Because I remember asking that. Um, it's actually upstream of it. So we took Barry Lane that uh, is tributary flows down to the viaduct. Okay. And basically, to, or to the same storm sewer on the one slide, if you want to go back to the gray line, um, it flows to the same storm sewer that drains the viaduct, or one of them. There's multiple storm sewers that drain the viaduct. Um, the storms, the storage we did on Berry Lane was just for the Berry Lane area, probably about 55,000 cubic feet of storage in the stone base. Um, we're talking how many acre feet in this basin? 10, 15 acre feet? Yeah, the, ba the storage under the roadway is no, it comes nowhere close to addressing what the viaduct has coming at it. Additionally, has the Heather Hill uh, area residents ex experienced or, or disclosed that they've experienced their own basements flooding? Have they? Yeah, on Berry Lane, on Oakmont, on Bobolink, between, uh, Barry, uh, between Oakmont and Berry I'm Lane. I'm just looking like Alexander Crescent, Kathleen Lane. Some of them, not all of them. Not, not all of them, not all of them, but more in the lower. Berry Lane, Oakmont's got some areas, but Berry Lane is I'm just one looking at, I mean, and I just pulled this up, and that's what the big that's, blue that's area south is. Down, that's south on Alexander, and that's then, south of the project area. Right, area. and if you look, actually, specifically, this is the area that I've pulled up is, I believe, where the project area would be. Uh, yes, now I'm there. And it, it's very blue, so I would... Um, would this mitigate any flooding that they would have in the neighborhoods? No, not to the south where the floodplain is. It's a separate uh, minor tributary that goes through on, uh, behind the homes on Alexander to that floodplain you're seeing at Alexander Lawrence. There's a small detention basin there and a culvert that goes under the uh, railroad tracks. Yeah, it's a separate uh, okay. tributary. This water from the basin here would be crossing an existing 42-inch storm sewer that goes the first private road and over to Brayburn and then south to Brookwood uh, Bridge where it uh, discharges in the Barfield Creek. I have a question. Are you finished? Yes, go ahead. Okay. My question is this. This is a decision that requires clarity, and there seems to be a lack of clarity at this point. Um, can you tell me specifically what the expected impact is for adding this retention basin in terms of the impact on the community along Berry Lane and the businesses by the Vida. What, let's talk as crystal clear as possible. Well, other than the, generally speaking, the flood mitigation benefits, which are pretty big, um, you wanna talk a little bit about the FEMA stuff uh, downtown? For sure. sure. Yeah, so, and, I, yeah and I think that was shown at some point, but it might not have, yeah. <laughs> So uh, FEMA has a benefit cost calculator that gets, you, you put in what you expect your cost to be, um, the, the uh, homes or the businesses that would benefit from it from the reduction through um, that exercise is that over the next 20 years, it would benefit about $5.7 million. For Just for the downtown area. Okay, for so specifically, we were having conversations around the amount of water that would this basin would have an impact on. Do we have clarity on that? I, I can tell you that for the 10 year storm, which is how many inches? It, it depends on the uh, intensity and duration. Okay, of this, so I think that's storm. part of the issue. 
because when we say 10 year, 25, 100, we know that you're referring to a percent or frequency of occurrence, mm -hmm. which is really not that clear. Clarity is when you say, hey, look, we have this amount of rainfall occurring, and this is when we expect the basin to have a positive impact on the residents of Berry Lane and the businesses by the viaduct. Absent of that, it's not real clear. Sure. I can, like I, like I told Mr. Nelson, we can get you some of that information that I don't have <clears throat> memorized now from our modeling efforts. Um, and I can tell you for the 10-year storm, 24-hour, this is how many inches it is, and this is how the viaduct is impacted. In, in all fairness, the magnitude of this decision for me as a board member is huge. Sure. I'm being asked to consider the possibility of allowing something that reduces the risk, reduces the safety of students at the school. And if I'm being asked to consider that, I expect a high degree of clarity in terms of how I move forward with making this decision. I'm a resident of Heather Hill. I drive by the property every single day. Mm -hmm. The current uh, retention basin south of the school, how deep is that particular basin? Oh, geez, I don't know off the top of my head. I would imagine probably around eight to 10 feet deep, probably. Eight to 10 feet. There's been yeah, standing water there for the past several weeks in that basin. The creek that comes down with the And so that wouldn't be an water. issue with this, no, this basin? No, there's not going to be a constant flow of creek flowing through the basin. The basin is only going to get water after the pipes fall and spills into it and then it drains out. That, what you're seeing there, is the actual stream that goes through the basin. I don't know, you can see the creek that crosses under Lawrence Crescent, but the creek that a ditch that goes behind the homes on Lawrence Crescent, I, I, it's always got water in it. I, I see <laughs> standing water. Well, there's water yeah. flowing in there. That's okay. what you're seeing, yeah. All right. Let me know if I'm belaboring the point, but uh, based on what, or going off of what John says, for this small storm events, the water will pass. Let me go back to here. Um, when the water comes down Sterling and then Lawrence, it will pass by the pond and go to the existing pipe under small storm events. It needs to reach uh, a, a larger storm event, something closer to the 10-year event, which I know you guys don't like, um, but when it reaches that point, then it starts going in the pond. So it, for storm events that would cause flooding at the viaduct, that is when the pond is utilized. Otherwise, it will remain dry. You good? Uh, I'd like a copy of that FEMA report. I don't think we've seen that. Okay. Okay. And, and then the one other thing I had was we've talked about other ways of accomplishing the goal that we're trying to accomplish now. I have no knowledge of it. The only thing I've been told is the cost might be double. That really doesn't mean much because of the different amounts of grant money, uh, what's the impact on grant money for some of the other scenarios. There's just a lack of clarity. And I, I demand clarity if I'm going to make a decision sure. that's yeah. going to put kids at risk. We can get you some of that information as well. I, one of these slides, and I don't know why the, the words aren't coming up, um, talked about how we have. there were, we looked at dozens of alternatives, including okay. 10 to 12 other locations for stormwater detention, uh, and none of them uh, most of them were more expensive, and none of them provided the same level of protection at the viaduct that this did. And but I, I would can get be you comfortable with that if we knew what the level of protection was with the project we're proposing, and we haven't put our finger on that at this point. It's standard in the industry for hy hydrologic and hydraulic modeling to put the recurrence interval on a storm, and this provides 10-year protection. Um, I'm not sure, like, like I said, I can get you more details about the size of those storms specifically, uh, but that's, that's the standard that we provide a certain level of protection for a recurrence interval for a storm. But I, I understand that's a standard, but I think the residents of Heather Hill need to understand what that means specifically for their community. Okay. Yeah. How many 10-year storms have we had in the last 10 years? I guarantee you it's more than one. Oh, it's a lot more. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. which is why it's kind of a silly name. But, the, um, but that said, they, I mean, practically what it means for them, right? Um, you know, five years ago we had a 10-year storm, everyone on Barry's Lane was flooded. Like they, they need, they could really benefit from a reminder of what's happened, and I'm sure we have that information. We know how many times Barry Lane's flooded. Uh, I know it's happened once because my wife tried to drive the car through it, it didn't go so well. <laughs> I was unhappy about that. 
So, you know, um, I think we need just to translate what 10 year storm means to specifics, how specifically, you know, what does a 10 year storm look like at the viaduct? I don't know. Is that, I mean, I've seen the viaduct flooded a thousand times. Right. So I need some sort of like, is that yeah. just the viaduct flooded or is it like that picture where it's all the businesses? I don't know. Yeah, and, and we have that information. I don't have the depths offhand, but we can get that too. You know, I, 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 I was trying to wait. I really was. So, Trey, go. No, go. No, I, I'm actually, thank you. Appreciate you. I think amazing points have already been made. I think the thing that I would add um, into the space is that this board is really required to follow the mission of engaging, inspiring, and empowering. And so I'm wondering how, what decision we make at this time, if we make a decision at this time, have you met the burden of proof around engaging, inspiring, and empowering? How we have done any of those things? What evidence is being brought to the space in order for us to do our job any better than what we're doing, right? And so, I mean, obviously we want to be great stewards to the people we're here to serve. And I'm just wondering on how we've met the burden of proof and or evidence to meet that criteria. And I think that there are a lot of questions that are still outstanding for, from my colleagues and um, the board members uh, and those that are still sitting that just leave some questions that I feel like needs to be answered. Brother Lanier. So um, I've seen and met you and you and you at the last presentation. I walked away with a lack of confidence that all of the things that we're still talking about tonight had been addressed. Then You've got more comments and concerns and questions from the community. And still, those don't seem to be addressed. You've started by saying that you've been working on this project since 2020. You still don't have everything addressed. I really lack the belief that you've thought about all of these items and that you'll actually be able to come back to this board with answers to satisfy not only this board's positions, but the residents' positions. For me, that is a travesty, and I'm disappointed. You started out with the Army Corps of Engineers design that you augmented and you took further. One of the things that also came out of your efforts and their efforts was that the detention basin was not the only option, that there were other options, and in particular, the North Conveyance. With the North Conveyance, they actually could go ahead and connect the pipe, the four, if I'm not mistaken, it's the 42 inch pipe. That's in, it's, what, what's the dimension? 60 inches? Correct. It would go. What would actually be re re replace it would be a 42. Okay. So that that would actually give you the design criteria of the 100 year. Is that correct? It is, but the problem is we can't just discharge water Well, I'm going to get to that, and and um, so, but I I like the way you said one thing and he said another. That's my whole point. It's not consistent. It's okay. It's, it's, all, it's all good. I'm, I'm going to summarize this. When I listen to what you guys are saying, it's not the same. It's not, it doesn't give me confidence that you've thought about the design. It doesn't give me confidence that you've also looked thoroughly at all the options. One of the things that Christina was actually talking about was the fact that now that we've gone ahead and opened up Thorn Creek, Thorn Creek actually now can go ahead and receive more water. I don't know whether or not you guys actually consider that in your design models. I also do understand that what Christina was getting at is that you guys said that the reasons that you were not going to use or look further into the North Conveyance was because of two factors. One was cost. 
The second was because of the neighbors. That's what she was getting at, the neighbors that are downstream. So what I just heard tonight was that, guess what? We actually may be able to find five million more dollars. Now, I understand that what you said was that we could then use the five million that we've got earmarked and then put that towards something else. Or you could actually go ahead and use the five million you've got plus five more million, half 10 million, and then that will take care of the cost aspect. And that's just a real simple aspect of looking at this. And then I also do know that if you've also got additional monies, and if you were working with the neighbors that are downstream, you could actually do something about Butterfield Creek. Now, again, I'm not sitting here trying to design it, but I'm just saying that these are some very simple aspects and considerations. And so I, I don't know how well thought out this is. When I hear that Lawrence Cresset is now going to go ahead and have to be under construction while the school year is going on, knowing that we've already had major issues with traffic flow around Heather Hill, where do you intend to send those people? We're gonna have just a cluster, and I'll let you fill in the rest of the dots. And we still have to deal with that. So that doesn't sound well thought out. What I'll say is this, we've, we've already experienced what happens with traffic flow. One particular resident tried to get a stop sign, couldn't even get the stop sign. We've ha we, I'm not going to take up the time to go ahead and give you all the evidence that we presented to the Heather Hill community about dissatisfaction with services from the village of Flossmoor. What I will say is this, and again, I'm just trying to give the down and dirty simple stuff. When you talk about burns, you're talking about now you've got ambient conditions with any residents that might have asthma, children, that's, that again is a, no, a, a whole other issue. So if we talked about um, maintenance with burning, we talked about traffic, and that's gonna be just all kind of jacked up. We now found that there's more money, so that takes, takes away the issue of looking at it. There is another option, and the other option is the North Conveyance, and I'm definitely gonna remind you about that because that's the one thing that you guys don't talk about because that would actually meet the 100-year design. That would take the water away. So there is a plan that actually could be implemented. That, that is, again, I'm not trying to get into the weeds about this. You, you, do, you do you do. You do you. Okay? Bill of Flossmore. You do you. But you want us to sign off on something. And that's why I'm saying I have a hard time even imagining doing so. Again, when you listen to the residents' concerns, you still haven't addressed all the residents' concerns. And they're the people that we represent. That's why they're here. I'm done. I have a few other questions. Um, on slide 10, you mentioned that there's um, something about land that you can't put anything on, that you can't build on, and there's... Is there <clears throat> is, no. No. Well, no, I mean, I like the one that's of the school, because okay. I, I want to envision the kids in the school. Yeah, this one. Where is that, that we can't, that, that you're talking about that's... So basically the whole map here, that, that whole area that says zone AE, because that is the floodplain, you can't develop that. <clears throat> you can't develop it, but parents talked about kids playing in that area right now. Sure. Okay, it's just you can't put buildings on it. Yeah. That's what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I had another question on slide 12. I just want to make sure I understand what, so what I'm visualizing here, you see that the row of bushes in the back, the, 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 the slope is on all sides of it, except where the fence is, right? Uh, the, the slope is everywhere. The slope is everywhere. All the, all oh, the oh, okay, all the way around. And this is with how much rainfall? This is a, it says a depiction of the basin after a 10-year storm. So I, in this scenario, how many inches of rain would we have gotten? 
I mean, just give because you're, this is not true. It's just a scenario. So give me an example. Okay. 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 Thank you. And I just want to point out that the larger storm events won't cause that water level to be higher. Than right. That. You covered right. that earlier. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, Dana, do kids actually use that area like during school? Do we use that area at all? I think kids will play out there for recess. We don't use it on purpose. It is perpetually soggy. And I've already shared the size of the spiders that are back there. So I avoid it at all costs. I forgot about the spiders. <laughs> um, OK, so we, I think you know, we would be voting on this at our next meeting. Well, well maybe. Well, they're, we they're need more information. Yeah, they're coming back. Well, no, well, yeah, I, I, that, that was a prerequisite, right? So. Um, I appreciate it's been a while since we last talked, but projected and what where the funding stands. And it's because the, the Army Corps project was to run a pipe down Floss Road and discharge right in Butterfield Creek and increase the flow into Butterfield Creek with no restriction. Okay. Nowadays, nowadays that would not be accessible, and that was 20 years ago. It's not acceptable method or standard nowadays. You'd be raising the floodplain down there and packing everybody. <clears throat> But you could also put valves in, so there's a, there are ways to mitigate a direct flow. Thank you very much. You, uh, there are things that can be sure. done. This is, the, this, is the, this is the part that's an insult. This is the part that's an insult. Well, okay, so take a breath. So to what he's saying, so if this hypothetical pipe, if for some reason the Army Corps of Engineers, oh, they probably, maybe they would care or not, I'm not really sure, but they put this pipe down Flossmoor Road, and it does flood Butterfield Creek out, and the people who are in Butterfield, I've walked those streets, are inundated, and they're literally underwater now. How do we put, like, where would we put a shutoff? Because I'm, I, like, how do you do, like, and then where does, once it's shut off there, like, where does that go next? You can restrict the pipe before it discharges into the creek. However, if you don't have a storage basin, you have no benefit to the pipe. You would need a storage. Okay. I see. But some of what's, but some of how this, but some of how this is actually run also still dumps into the, to the, um, the deep tunnel project. So that, we'll, we, 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 again, without getting, without getting into just. Uh, uh, agree to disagree. I've already looked at the research on it, so I, I, we could. You and I can talk about. You and I can talk about this outside. So, I think what the board though needs from you guys in writing is, oh, ideally in writing, or so that we can read it instead of have another set of questions. Um, that you know, why wasn't that? I, I remember there being reasons. I don't remember what they are. So, uh, what are the reasons why that plan is not being followed? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to explain to the community why, in your best judgment, engineering judgment, why this is the only way to solve the problem. And that's missing currently from your presentation. I can. Um, so the, the other alternatives that we looked at, other areas to store detention, either didn't work because they were not downstream of where the problem was, um, or we were looking at underground detention, which is a lot more expensive, or we didn't have uh, willing partners in the case of the north conveyance that was mentioned earlier. Um, so this is the most the property practical that's, that's and not feasible. A willing partner in the case of the north conveyance? Flossmoor Golf Club. Okay. Um, uh, okay. And if I could just, while I have the microphone, if I can just make a comment with respect to, to funding, um, our $10 million uh, bond was approved for dual purpose. It was approved not only for uh, viaduct improvements, but also street improvements. And the village board was very clear and continues to be very clear that they want us to pursue as much grant funding as possible to offset this project so that more monies can be used towards streets. So again, that would be a village board decision, but as it stands today, they do not support using the full 10 million toward the viaduct project. But that. didn't, but, but so didn't a, little, a little bit of clarity. So this is a part of, I think part of the challenge here 
is relying too much on oral meetings and some of this stuff should just be in writing because there is a little bit of I think would avoid uh, some some tension in, in the discussion just to have clarity around some of those points I have the benefit of complaining to my wife at home and get and, and getting some of my questions answered but nobody else here does so um, I, I don't I think that some of those second third level questions haven't been answered um, I'm sorry David. I didn't mean to cut you off so Bridget the way I understand it unless I'm reading it wrong or I've, I've seen it wrong that with the ten million dollars that, that we're talking about that the village has already done street repairs out of that ten million that was phase one this is actually phase two so so the way you and I'm not saying you're trying to mislead the conversation but it's not like the ten million is at the it's going to be the divide lock first and then the street second the streets have already been done this is what's left am I correct or incorrect it's so a phase of street work uh, has been done. So bond monies have been used toward um, street resurfacing. Two million, and we're hoping to be able to do another phase of street resurfacing. Um, so no, the, ten, the full 10 million is not available for, that, for this project. Correct. All I'm saying is that I, this phase one was the streets, in which you just agreed to. You, so you use that for two, two million of it, and I get that. That's all my only point I want to make, Cam. I think what's interesting also for our board uh, to consider is the unintended consequences of standing water in the spring, summer, early fall around our school. Well, what do you mean by standing water? Because they've been pretty clear on that. that I mean, but if the water sits there for X amount of time. They're assuring us it'd be nine hours at most. Yeah. And how, I'm what is the sure. life reproductory system of a mosquito? Well, right? Of standing water. Like, I'm just saying that yeah. that potentially could be, are we unintentionally, the question, and it's a common unintentionally question. now exacerbating a mosquito I problem around the I around our schools is is the question that I'm asking. This Cam. is a wrong assumption, but I assume that with the nine hour drawdown that that wasn't an issue. I also Correct. assume because the, the, the area there is soggy all the time anyway, that there may not be a meaningful difference. But if I, I don't actually know how long it takes for mosquitoes to. Just do whatever they do. Uh, well, I'm, yeah, no, I'm, m mosquito larvae cannot develop within nine hours. We have asked that question. Is it possible to compare, and it probably isn't, I'm just thinking of, and I can't, Michael, is it What's Highland that? Park, back further yeah. where we were at? Yeah. So where that area is that Butterfield just naturally flows into, like that's standing water sitting there. I mean, yes, right. So I'm, I'm. Oh, for mosquitoes. Yes, I'm. I'm trying to compare. Oh, what's the impact? Like the the impact is honestly, if you ask me, I'm looking at the impact of like mosquito reproduction, which we're not. That's silly, but like there's standing water already there, naturally forming. This would be a, even more temporary event if you will there i'm not sure about of the depth of the highland park it's basin i'm gonna go walk it tomorrow i can guarantee you that okay yeah, i'll put my waders on but i yes i because that's me i'm gonna be i have walked this area i have been to highland park and now i'm gonna go see the floodwaters tomorrow so yep that's Thank you. I appreciate your information. You're welcome. We're happy to pull together. I've been taking notes as we've been talking. Um, I know there's you know, some confusion on the 10-year, 100-year, how that's defined. I'm happy to put that in writing for you so it can be more clear. It doesn't help that in the last couple of years that whole modeling has changed. Yeah. Um, and what's defined as a 10-year flood is different now than it was a couple of years ago. Um, but we'll, we'll work to provide as much clarity on this as possible. Uh, we'll send some information um, to Dr. Smith to disseminate to the board 
um, and then we look forward to coming back before you. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all very Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the summer 2024 health life safety bids. Oh, man. <laughs> we lost them. Dana, you know what? I forgot to talk to you about this. Isn't it winter assessment update? Good evening. Oh. Okay. It's to you and me. Yeah. Is that I, next? I, I have either. winter assessment update. There's about a hundred people. It was updated. Okay. I'll refresh. You'll be I'll, okay. <laughs> I'll refresh. refresh. Um, we did the final bidding for the summer of 2024 work, and that's the health, life, safety, um, electrical work. Um, that is mostly um, fire alarms and panels and lights and so on. It's, it's minimal work there. Um, we got, we had three bidders, um, the high was 190,500 and the low that we are recommending is from Airport Electric for 163,828, um, with all fees, et cetera, included, it's, right now we have an estimate of 221,000, however, I am negotiating back with Wold because the actual cost came in significantly lower than what their fee was based on, so I am still negotiating with them to get that down. Um, that's kind of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Questions? Yeah, questions? I thought that was kind of straightforward. It felt straightforward to no, me. No, now that I've caught up. No, I'm okay. good. Yeah. yeah. So I, this one will come back to you for approval next board meeting. The yeah. ones that are in your action item are the ones that we talked about last, last right. meeting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the winter assessment update. <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Hi. Hi. So as Dr. Smith mentioned, uh, our winter assessment update provides us with an excellent opportunity to students uh, make some course corrections and identify our next checkpoint, which is our uh, spring map and ultimately our state assessments at, at the end of the school year. Um, so we'll start with just bringing back some of our uh, behavior attendance and grades data that we started to review uh, under the bag reports earlier this school year. Is this on? Yes, yeah. it's on. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. You're good. We can okay. hear you. Yes. Good. <laughs> Make sure I'm talking yeah. into it properly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we, we wanted to come back to this uh, as we start to start the school year really wanting to have uh, our eye on behavior and attendance and grades as key levers to uh, support our students and also intervene. Uh, earlier than we have in the past to be able to support everyone. So starting with uh, bringing back a comparison of our di discipline data uh, for Parker Junior High School, this is a comparison of the first semester of the 2022-23 school year versus the first semester of this year, uh, a comparison in the number of in-school suspensions as well as out-of-school suspensions. Um, so what we have noticed is a uh, dramatic decline in uh, to 2022-23 in the fall in the first semester of the school year, first half of the year, uh, we had 238 in-school suspensions. Uh, the first semester of this year, we've had 94. Of course, we don't want any in-school or out-of-school suspensions, um, but we know the hard work that the Parker team has been doing to monitor student discipline, uh, being able to intervene sooner, uh, and support students who need uh, the, the additional check-ins, whether it's check-in, check-out, or the PASS program, uh, those things that we've put in place, including adding additional deans um, and assistant principals to really support our students in the middle school model. Uh, we see those things having a positive impact on discipline. And I know uh, Principal Paris will talk more about the things that they're doing in the mid-year SIP update. I don't, I don't wanna go ahead and take up too much of this, but the question I've been really curious about we made an investment in the what are those things called pouches yonder, yonder bags. bags the yonder bags and 
I've been looking forward to seeing this report to ask, are the yonder bags actually contributing to this reduction? What do you guys think? Is that a direct connection yeah, uh, to redu kind of reductions in s suspensions and in school and out of school? I think it just globally, uh, I, I think I can speak for the team in comparison, the, the number of students who were getting referrals for multiple technology offenses uh, prior to having the yonder bags, I, I would assume that the, the decrease is reflected in here. And engagement as well, because and, they're yeah, not the, on their phones. The, the reason I ask that is because I've read several articles about um, telephones in classrooms and how you can actually see the correlation between the, the discipline issues and the reduction of it directly related to the fact that they're paying more attention, et cetera, et cetera on and on and on. And that's why, I guess, because we made that investment, I really wanted to know, are we getting bang for the buck on that? And I see these numbers going down. I'm wondering how much that contributed, if anything, um, so that's why I asked that question. Absolutely, I think it's, it's, it's definitely a contributing factor. It's hard to isolate any one thing, uh, but we know beginning of the school year, we, we talked a lot about wanting to make it and re these types of reductions and wanting to do more. Uh, so I think it's probably a combination of multiple things, including the yonder bags, but I, I would stress really the, the people and the personnel that we've invested in have really had the most impact on wrapping around students this year. Next, uh, looking at the number of students uh, from the first quarter to the second quarter of this school year uh, with two or more Ds or Us, so struggling grade or failing grade in any class. Um, so we'd see this by grade level, uh, quarter one, we'll just take sixth grade as an example, 118 students with uh, at least two D or U grades, um, and then quarter two, a little bit up at 120. Uh, so that's something that we are monitoring and we want to look into further. Uh, we don't want any students having any failing grades. We also want to make sure uh, that we're aware of the core classes versus uh, encore classes. Again, not to say that any of those classes are, are more important than others, um, but we, we intervene differently in a math class than we would if, if it's a physical education or an art class like that. Um. This up there it says 23, 24, but this slide is just, it's just this, I'm sorry, it's just this school year, right? We don't have comparison to last year. We could bring that back. This is just do, this school year. Just yes. Make sure I understand. This is just the quarter one of this school year compared to quarter two. Hmm. Would then, you, sorry. I was just going to ask, would you, I mean, maybe we could have predicted this, I'm guessing, just because the, concepts the ideas build on them so if they were struggling in quarter one there's a good chance that they might have continued and then also additional kids i guess i'm saying it's not shocking to me that there sure. is some increase i mean like we have to really work on quarter one um to decrease if we're like if we're gonna see it decrease in quarter two. Absolutely, and looking ahead to quarter three, which we're in yeah. right now, and quarter four, where the content gets even more challenging, right. and, and by that point, we're talking about summative uh, grades for the school year. It's really about how we intervene at this point so that we can support yeah. course correction, and that's why this mid-year update is so important. And see, for me, my question would be, as we go ahead and we change from quarter one and went to quarter two, was there any staffing or personnel changes? Just like in the other slide, it was attributed to that. So was there a, um, a, a, a difference? And if, if I can see at the beginning that after training had taken place and there was the learning curve, et cetera, I would think that we got to quarter two, that all those systems are in place, and there is a familiarity. I actually would have expected there to be a drop just because of that. Sure, I think a couple of factors we have to keep in mind, uh, new students transfer in, so it may not be the same students from quarter one to quarter two, uh, but that is something that the team has to dig into, and they are, and just making sure we know who the students are that need the additional support. 
Uh, in terms of additional staff for quarter two, I don't know that we, we have not added additional staff to support with this, but this is where tutoring comes in. This is where identifying students who would benefit from an, inter an academic intervention uh, or contacting parents and making sure that parents are understanding uh, what's going on with the student's grades so that they can support at home. Those types of interventions would, would be appropriate for this. In other board meetings, you've talked about the bag process, and I don't, I, I didn't see any, there's, there's not any hard data here, but qualitatively, I mean, have all of these students been talked to, have all their parents been talked to, is there an intervention place for each of these students? Yes, I, I feel very confident that our schools are utilizing the data in the bag reports to talk to teachers first. Make sure that the teachers understand what's going on with the students, uh, whether it's through PLC meetings or at Parker having the MTSS meetings and making sure that they're checking in with students. Um, and really, not just collecting the data, but to your point, utilizing the data to contact parents, talk to students. Um, and apply the intervention. Tutoring is one that, as an example, uh, we struggle with getting students to attend consistently at the junior high level, um, and that's something that we're, we're trying to do better with. So, tell me about the parent contact piece of this. Mm -hmm. well, well, every parent who has a student that has had what is having get, has a dear you had a phone call just saying, hey, I'm checking in. This obviously isn't acceptable. What are you doing about it at home? How can we help? Yes, we do uh, have, have teachers make well, what we call DU contacts, and uh, we also have teachers share the bag reports with parents and discuss them. Uh, we did that at the uh, report card pickup time, and we'll continue as needed. So what is, a, what is a typical parent reaction? This is like a third of our students, right? 300 this is by the end of the total. Yeah. Uh, this Total. Uh, total, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I... I know we have a couple of students whose parents can be, I don't care, but I, I'm assuming the majority of the parents don't say that. So what is a typical response to, to that phone call? Yeah, and typically uh, parents absolutely do care. And uh, a lot of times it's in, uh, not an awareness of the grades and uh, some in the, the spectrum of that, not understanding how to check the grades and so showing how to walk through ac accessing the grades in Canvas. Um, and then also identifying like, like what's going to be the next step. How are you going to hold your child accountable to getting the work done? A lot of times, th remember this is grades, this isn't scores. Uh, so this is based on a lot of missing assignments. And I think that the team would agree also that those, those grades really do come down to, um, I, I just didn't get it in. I didn't do the work and so I have to do the work to get the grade up. Is there also a way, oh, Hugo, I'm sorry. Do you I, mind? No. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering as you look at the data that you've presented, um, I'm sure you're trying to interrupt um, kind of a rising trend in students who are receiving Ds or Us. Um, my wondering is when you, so this is the, the G part of the BAGS report. Absolutely. Right? And so do you see any trends relative to the B behavior in A's, the attendance that relegate to the, to the G's that go along with this? Do you find when you kind of triangulate all three sure. data points, do you see a kind of uh, consolidation um, amongst, a, uh, uh, amongst a trend? Or is it, does it feel random when you look at all three? Uh, mixed bag. I will say, in general, uh, the biggest trend is the correlation between attendance and grades. So, like we've, we've discussed before, you know, at this point in the school year, we're, we're sort of maxed out on uh, kids who aren't coming to school but can still keep an A, B grade up. Uh, that, that's just not likely because, to Dr. Griggs's point earlier, the work gets harder, there's more accountability that starts to pile up. Um, so there is an absolute correlation between the attendance of the students and their grades. Could you, is there a way the next time we see this, I'm assuming that of the 118, all of them are not in the 120. So there are some students who now have, have no, progressed out of have that, progressed, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It would be helpful just to see that so we can see the pro. I mean, because that highlights the pro some progress. Absolutely. Yes, we can look at that closely for okay. the next presentation. Yeah, because Amabel, for me, the, the, the two that really 
are, I'm trying to use the word disturbing, but bothersome for me are the sixth grade because those are the students who just came from fifth grade. Um, and I would be hopeful that those numbers would have gone down. But then what's even more, again, troubling for me is the eighth graders because now those are the ones we're about to send to high school. Absolutely. And I would, I would hope that we would really be trying to help HF by sending over some quality. Can you go to the next slide? Please? Individuals. Sure. Yeah. So I think as we have this whole conversation, you asked about correlation. I would closely watch the attendance numbers as you go through the data for the rest of this. There's an absolute connection between students coming to school and their performance consistently. It's consistent. We can have the best teachers, we can have the best programs where we're struggling to make meaningful headway is with the kids who don't come to school. And so as we talk about all of this, really, as we go through, That's a lot. look at these numbers and then follow it along through the data presentation. So, so we, double, we double check these numbers, right? These, the 40% at Parker, right? And so when we talk about that number, that's a number that's sitting somewhere around 380 students, plus or minus, have missed 10 or more days. As we make those phone calls, there's a myriad of issues. Annabelle's right, our parents care. They want their kids in school. Mm -hmm. It could be an issue with working a third shift job. It could be an issue with uh, not having childcare before school, all those different pieces. So, so I think on our end, we're trying to troubleshoot some of those that typically fall outside the purview of a school district. Sure. If we can solve them, it only makes our lives easier. So I would say you'll probably hear attendance in a number of the SIP updates because this is such a major area for us. It's not by accident that I mentioned it with kindergarten registration. We know the outcomes for kids who missed school. We can almost predict where they're going to live, how far they're going to move from our home community based on time out of school, grades, achievement, all those pieces. So I think we're really kind of focused on what that means from a, from a larger systems perspective. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Because we're also faced with this piece of the system may be working for the kids who are here and generating the data that we're looking for. And for the kids that aren't here, there's a different subset piece. So I think that's, that's also where we're wrestling with the information. So we certainly welcome your questions on this topic to help us at least expand our view on this because this is an area we spend an inordinate amount of time talking about uh, because chronic absenteeism is that impactful on our school district. So uh, I really appreciate the process you guys have gone through this year and the extra attention to these students. Sure. But we've also, the truancy thing has come up mm -hmm. all through all our board meetings, all through the fall. Yeah. And so I, I gotta ask you to be honest with yourselves about is anything you're doing actually working on the truancy mm -hmm. part? Sure. Right. I know you guys have done, you've, you've made phone calls, you, yeah. you, everyone's out there trying, but if it's not working, it's January now, is there anything the board can do, even if it's something crazy out of the box, but how do we, I'm worried that through no fault of your own, sure. right, this trend will continue through the rest of the year. So it, it is a national trend. I, I will say that we are accessing the best research available on this topic and implementing it, not waiting for anything. I think we change directions, not change direction, but add steps to mm -hmm. our absenteeism piece as much as possible. Um, but, it's, but despite your best efforts, mm -hmm. not a big, I mean, look, maybe it'd be more far worse, but for your efforts, I don't know. Uh, maybe. But, but really, what can we do about that 40%? If, I mean. <clears throat> undo COVID. I, and I, I don't mean that in jest. Right. Coming out of COVID, there's a different perspective among families when it comes to missing school, when it comes to accessing uh, curriculum materials on Canvas, when it comes to just the importance of physically being there for the conversations. And so outside of that, you know, I mentioned I'm meeting with the Flossmoor Community Relations Commission because we have to start thinking about this in different ways that are outside of the school district other than you know, going to every house and you know, helping get a kid dressed and eat breakfast and then go to school. So we're really trying to focus on what that message is, what that outreach is, how do we support our families who are certainly focused on this but may not have the ability to 
impacted for any number of reasons on a daily basis. So what's the, and I know I keep asking this and I keep getting, it varies from family to family, but is there, uh, what, that's a big number, that's 300 students. There, what, yeah. what is the most common issue amongst those 300 students? Um, a lack of, uh, <laughs> what, what's the most impactful? Having clear expectations and boundaries as a family unit. And I'll give you an example as we talk about yonder bags and those sorts of situations. When a parent will tell you, well, I don't know how to get them off of social media. When a child shouldn't be on social media until they're 13, that's a, that's a skill issue as opposed to a willingness issue. Because again, I have, I have, all of our parents are here for it. They're here for their kids. They're here for us. They are here for this community. If there's a skill set difference on whether or not they have those boundaries in place, I think that's a challenge that we face a lot. Is that the kids up too late, or is it they're just, they're just teenagers and they're just not going to school? They're, they're willfully disobeying their parents. I don't, I don't know that this is students cutting school. This is students not coming to school in a number of cases with permission. Okay. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense. But so I'm asking, you know. Hey, uh, I, I don't feel good. I don't want to go. Like, okay. At least 20 kids out of the 300 mm -hmm. must have the same issue, right? Sure. Like, what's, what's the low hanging fruit? What's the biggest group of kids in common issue? And what, if anything, can we do to throw resources at that problem? Yeah, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dovetail, and, and I appreciate your perspective. Um, when I hear that question, I understand that what Cam is saying is, okay, you're bringing this information to the, to the board, which again, we, 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 we receive, and when we have issues, we are saying, okay, what can we do? And it's, again, we're acknowledging that you've done stuff, which is cool, all right, but the results aren't there. Um, one of the things I have an issue with, just as a personal side, is normalizing kind of what is taking place, and I'm very much in favor of trying to look at things, quote unquote, outside the box, or, or things that actually might even be aggressive. Mm -hmm. Because again, I think what we all want to see, my favorite phrase, is to see the needle move. And so I, that's why I don't necessarily think that you're gonna give me an answer tonight. Um, but I, I, I do, I am in favor of saying, is, is there something else maybe that you're saying, let's look, we can look at, that, look at something else and get back to you. At the elementary school, we're averaging more than a 5% decrease. Right? So when we say it's not working, we need to put this in context. Is it pre-COVID? Absolutely not. Remember, pre-COVID, we were sitting somewhere around 8.5%. And so I, I certainly want to clear up that this is not working. This is, this is the impact of the work that has been done from a social worker perspective, from adding assistant principals, from adding deans, making those connections individually. So I'm, I'm happy with this direction. I don't love 40% of our students, but remember, even after COVID, we were sitting somewhere around 33%. Last year, we were at 24%. So if you see these numbers in relation to that, we're moving in the right direction. But we have, obviously, room to grow. Yeah, so I'm looking at these numbers, and I think a few things. So one, um, there's clearly a culture gap between elementary schools and the middle school, right, that I think is sitting there, right? I think our elementary schools are doing something that kids are coming more often. Kids vote with their feet. They might tell you, I don't wanna be here. If they show up every day, they're buying your product, right? And so I know that there has been a recent modification in going to a, uh, a model that is more small school to make the, the grade levels feel more homogenous and like together so that they would feel seen. I think uh, to Kim's point around being able to compare different points in time may be helpful to be able to say, well, is this shift helpful or not? I don't know, we'll you know, see that when we see you know, the potential data. Um, I think the magic number around chronic absenteeism is, is 18 days, right? Which is 18 absences in 180 days. And so where are we right now versus where we could be? Like, so all of these students are clearly on track to be chronically absent which is going to be detrimental to, you know, um, 
uh, the school designations, right? Um, but the truth is, is that like what we're doing that's potentially working is, is kind of like where I would love to spend some time, like what do we see that's working? How do we double down, triple down on those 10 interventions so that we don't get to the 18 days? Where are we right now relative to the 18? How, how many students have crossed that threshold as of today? How, how do we make sure that they don't is probably a bigger feat so that they don't, so that we're not in the chronic absenteeism part, um, I think is a very, very big deal. I, I mean, however, I think the interventions around trying to make sure we're taking bigger communities in the middle school and make them smaller to make them feel like is the right move. My wondering is, I mean, to the point that's, that's really kind of being marked, marked is, is that having a, uh, a value on, on attendance and grades and behavior. So when we go back to the previous slide around the behaviors part, are we seeing less behaviors in the small, you know, uh, in terms of number of disciplinary for referrals, six, seven, and eight per last year prior to the shift? Are we seeing an increase in GPA versus the shift? Are we seeing, you know, are we seeing the things that we hope to have seen? I think we're probably seeing, like we're probably there and, and um, you know, Dr. Crawford, I think we are. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if they're captured in those slides, but I just want to offer the, the, the space for you to, to speak to those. If I could just add a, a few things. Um, uh, going back to, Cam, your question around what is what are the, the major issues, um, it is that parental tenacity to motivate and stay on your child to go to bed on time, get up on time and sort of start that cycle right every day. Um, the other piece is uh, that I hear the most is uh, families in and out of crisis. We're having a hard month where something's going on with us. Uh, we try to provide the support when we're aware of those situations, whether it's mental health support um, or we need some other resource. Our social workers are, are working really hard to make sure that we're connecting families to the resources that we do have control over. Uh, additionally, you're absolutely right. We are approaching this by constantly reading nationally what our school's doing to impact this problem and trying something different every quarter, every month, um, knowing that this spring we are going to ramp up our student and parent incentives to keep students motivated as the, it gets warm outside and it's easier to want to stay home and, and not do school. Um, that's the next step to just make sure we're doing everything that we can that the research shows has an impact. And what we're learning is that one thing alone is not going to have the huge dent that we, we want. It's doing all of those things and having a, a compounding effect. What, to Dr. Smith's point, um, what, we are, what is promising is that while the numbers are high, we're also seeing a decrease in our elementary schools and it's a slight increase at Parker, but we're, we're holding steady too, because that number as the school year goes on to, to uh, Dr. Childress's point, we don't want that number to expand as, as the school year continues. I mean, I, and, and you're right, this is a chronic problem everywhere, right? So adolescent suicide and suicide ideation is at an all time high. The entire country is trying to figure out why our kids are so sad. And you have parents who now are much more worried about the mental health of their kid over the academic. They want to make sure that their kids make it through middle school. We're dealing with parents who, and families who are still struggling post COVID. And the idea that they would say, I'd rather you stay home than fight with you for the next hour and a half for you to go is now an, an option that they're taking. And so now you're talking really about social services that we can offer to parents who are struggling to go to work, much less struggling to get their kid to middle school. I, I mean, wonder, if this is a bigger problem. I wonder if uh, we should get, we should be making some effort to get these parents together. I don't want, not, not in the sense of, hey, you, or at least to think about you're this. You're all the parents of the deadbeat kids, more in the sense of, you know, oh, you are support. all dealing with the same problem. Um, and uh, I, I, I wonder if, so social services have their place, but I 
I suspect that many of these families are missing that connection with the community or even some of the simple as, you Could know what, I've be. been through this with my kid and eventually I got sick of it and said suck it up and go to school and everything was fine. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if, I, I, if you're telling me that say half of that 40% are in this bucket, then, then what I'm saying is let's, let's try something. Yeah. Um, if, if it's a smaller number, then, then maybe that's not a great idea. But if we have, you know, 100 families sure. who are in that, I'm struggling to deal with my kids spending so much time on social media, and, and I'm struggling just to tell my kid to go to bed and, and take or take his phone away or just, or, or, or whatever. I'm afraid to tell him no because of mental health issues. You know, uh, maybe part of the solution is letting those parents know that there's 100 other parents out there dealing with the same Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And we have done some of that informally on a, a much smaller yeah. scale of, you know, calling a parent and saying, you know, what's going on with your child's attendance? And after three or four phone calls, you know, you, you start to get to know each other and you have a relationship, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, talking. Uh, but there are, have been a few parents that we've been able to connect with other parents. Um, it's It also uh, is a has to be a, a personal level of comfort allowed with between the two families yeah. um, to feel comfortable enough to share phone numbers yeah. and you know making that connection. Uh, we have done that on a smaller scale informally with some of just our higher needs families and where it was appropriate. Um, that's something we can absolutely do more of. I don't say you have to. I'm just yeah. Uh, it's so just we one think about it. But yeah. Uh, if that's the problem, so mm -hmm. so. And I gave you guys a hard time last year about agility, right? So if that's the problem, I know it's way outside of our normal wheelhouse as educators, sure. but it ain't going to fix itself. And I don't know any other way to do it than to dive into those issues. I can tell you we finally heard from the buildings that their pressure on attendance is starting to outstrip their bandwidth. Starting to do what? Outpace their bandwidth because we are spending so much time and redirecting resources from social work, for example, to work on these issues that we're having to make choices about serving groups of students and things of that nature because this is so impactful and so important. So uh, we're with you, but I, if, you, if you take anything away from this, know that every idea is, is viable. And I, I will say, that as we keep applying them, some work, some don't. Mm -hmm. We're cutting the ones that don't. We are currently at figuring out how to offer incentives so we can do raffles to try to reduce these numbers, which I've never done in 24 years, right? Yeah. And I'm so, <laughs> I'm, 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 and, and sure. I, not to, I'm not trying to step on your words, but I'm surprised that that aspect, because one of my recurring questions is, what do we do with ESSER funds? And so with ESSER funds, we actually went ahead from, in, in generalizing the statement, but we put a lot of those into, into staffing. And so we had extra students, uh, I'm sorry, extra staff to try to deal with some of the, the issues of COVID. And so my constant question was, are we getting bang for the buck? Or did those teachers, did those ESSER resources that we were putting in place, did they really bring about a change. And so when I kind of hear that, you know, that, that we're still seeing the results of COVID, then I'm, I'm going to ask, well, did those staff or those extra staff today really do anything? I appreciate that segue because the answer is yes. And the answer is yes when you look at the data, when you look at the growth, when you look at the achievement, particularly in math. As you're aware, we added math interventionists. Incredibly happy with that growth incredibly happy with those changes. We've added social workers. So where we did spend the ESSER money in, in full focus on supporting students and staff members, we have achieved success. Attendance at the moment, or at that moment, was not a stated crisis area. As we've gotten into that, we've reallocated funds, we've used them differently. So yes, we've moved the needle. We've, we've had plenty of bang for that buck with that ESSER money. I'd love if a few more million could come but that's not going to happen at this point, right? So as we're making choices and we'll be making those staffing choices later in the school year in about a month and a half, we will then come to the conclusion of those, which means reductions in staff. And so as we think about all of those different impacts, I feel very comfortable that we were amazing stewards of that money, that we used it to help children. The data will prove that. It doesn't matter what I feel, the data will prove that. And as we think about the student attendance issue, again, that is a national issue, I'm happy with 
what's happening. It's not fast enough for anybody. Remember, in a perfect world, this gets down to 8.5%. So we've got a long way to go, but we need to think about it differently, and we need to think about it differently from a, a community standpoint and not just a school issue because those Venn diagrams overlap and we are limited in how much we can impact what happens at home currently. But Dr. Childress is right. If it's worth attending, they'll be there. So as we're talking about all of these pieces, we're also looking at programs, we're looking at curriculum, we're looking at student experiences, we're looking at extracurricular uh, opportunities, we're thinking about teacher negotiations, we're talking about all of these pieces because we can't reduce our way into some simple, if we do A, then B will happen. This is a, an incredibly complex issue with multiple inputs in order to get this one output, and I think that's where we're spending most of our time. Okay, and thank you. And the only reason I also add, added that was because I know some of these factors contribute to our evidence-based funding and, and how we actually get more money to add to these, some of these, these, these endeavors. And that's why, I'm, again, trying to figure out how do I, or how does the board try to figure out where do we get that bang? Thank you for the segue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Moving ahead to uh, the winter assessment data, uh, we'll, talk, we'll also talk about the winter Ames Web assessments. And our, our schools will also expand on the things that they're doing in their buildings and the mid-year SIP presentations. So overall, just looking at the uh, winter map assessments, uh, we are uh, noticing that the math data in particular is promising. Uh, we're, we saw a lot of growth um, in our, our schools around their math achievement. Um, and also want to just keep a healthy pulse on this because this is winter. So the whole school year still needs to play out. Um, this is our, our first time doing winter map in about five years. Uh, so this is the first time in a long time that we've had this stable checkpoint um, to really course correct and, and have that opportunity in the middle of the school year. Uh, so just looking at each of our schools, uh, the first row or the first column is uh, the fall achievement. So this is where our students performed in comparison to that percentile of, of the rest of the students in the norm group. So uh, for example, in the fall, the achievement for math <coughs> at Foster Hills was in the 50th percentile. In the winter, uh, it was at the 65th percentile. If you look at the keys at the bottom, uh, that's where, where we ideally want our schools to be is of course in the 61st to the 80th or the eight above 80th percentile. Um, that is different than what we've discussed in the past in terms of uh, really in the past focusing more on just the growth. Uh, what we know is that the achievement is also really important. We have to make sure uh, that all of our roads at the end of the year are leading to uh, grade level success on the state assessments uh, because that really is the, the final measure for our school district. So just looking ahead, uh, Heather Hill, 37th percentile uh, for achievement in the fall, 41st percentile. So we can see the, the changes or the change in score percentiles uh, at the end on the, the chart there. Um, one thing that we want to note is that uh, we have saw really good growth at both Flossmoor Hills and Western Avenue, uh, with both of the schools being in uh, Flossmoor Hills in the 80th percentile nationally for math growth and Western Avenue being in the 83rd percentile uh, nationally, which is really outstanding growth, uh, which led to uh, them sort of moving into the next tier of achievement. So that's something that we want to see continue. Uh, we have been working closely with our teachers this year using the grade level proficiency scales um, embedded into our curriculum. So we're confident that that's having a positive impact on instruction. Um, just really making sure that all students are getting the uh, same level of access to grade level content with the scaffolding support if they're below grade level uh, to meet the grade level standard. Any questions on the math chart? So this looks weird to me. It looks I weird couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. It, this, this data looks weird to me just historically, right? Because usually, well, for example, Serena historically has the highest growth of all of our schools on NVA at least. I think it has. And, and then uh, I usually expected to see more growth 
because mm -hmm. uh, they tend to bring in students at a lower percentile and sure. raise them up more. Um, but I also, the, the Flossmore Hills and Western Avenue growth numbers seem high, mm -hmm. just compared to historical data. So what's different? Why does it look like this? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, it's, it's been a long time since we've done winter data. So I think one thing, again, I'm cautiously optimistic with the winter data because we have to keep our eyes on the spring and rounding out the entire school year. You're absolutely right. Historically, we do see uh, those percentages much higher because the kids are, if their kids are coming in lower, there's just, there's more of a bump that they get when you round out the entire school year. So what we're really looking ahead to is that over the entire school year, that growth continues. Um, the, uh, that being said, the growth at Flossmoor Hills and Western Avenue, uh, I think we can really point to uh, some very key things and um, systems and instructional expectations uh, that the schools have really leaned into and, and dug hard into uh, to contribute to that growth. So I, I don't want to minimize that growth at all. <laughs> Um, because I, they, I let their principals talk, but I, I know that they've worked really hard to um, ask some really tough questions instructionally um, and keep coming back to it week by week uh, to get that growth as well. I think, you know, to um, Mr. Nelson's point, I think my question slash comment mm -hmm. um, are, are rather similar. Um, as a Flossmore Hills parent, uh, I know that my son cares about his test scores because his teacher really cares about his test scores. And that's not a question that I have to necessarily have with him around, hey, it's testing time, I need you to care, right? Sure. And so I understand when it comes to map assessment that it is both um, a I need you to care and I need you to be equipped, right? Absolutely. And I'm definitely trusting the district to do all that you are doing to make sure that they are equipped and i think the other part is the care when you sit down with the computer or the ipad or whatever the vehicle is, is that you're actually really invested into the space my wondering is is there a discernible difference between the different school um, climates i'm sure they're getting all of the amazing instruction that you would want because that is what you spend a lot of time on my wondering is is there a different from a climate perspective around the care and the investment is there any discernible difference and you can think about that from the sure. four elementary schools as well as you know um is there a discernible difference between within the elementary schools as well as the high school which is requires a different i think level of investment amongst the adults to make sure that they care, particularly around mid-year assessments, which can be a hard thing to It can sell. be very hard, absolutely. And I, I, I uh, just going back to the, the culture question, you know, I think climate can, can ebb and flow in any building, any school, any, any place, um, depending on what's going on at the time. Uh, but you're absolutely right, culture does impact uh, how invested students are in their work and their and how much they they want to to be there and be there and do well um, so I, I know our schools will get into some of the things that they've all done collectively around culture and climate whether it's PBIS or celebrations I know that all of our teachers and our principals are working incredibly hard to make their environments places where kids want to really work hard one thing that we're also doing uh, with our administrators and trickling into our teachers is just some shared work around collective educator efficacy, uh, that this idea that uh, all teachers, all staff are on the hook for making sure that students achieve at high levels and that we all play a part in that. So we're doing a book study on that with our administrators. Our administrators are then sharing those conversations and those resources with teachers. Uh, we do think those conversations are shifting the tide at, at schools and helping teachers think differently about their instruction and contributing to positive impact for kids. Thank you. Thank you. Also looking at our reading, we did not see as high uh, achievement uh, gains at, in our, our reading scores. Um, we are not using the uh, proficiency scales this year for elementary uh, teachers, K through five, we're using math only. We wanted to 
ease into that uh, because our elementary teachers have a lot on their plates, but we will be introducing uh, the scales at all subjects and all grade levels next year. Um, so just looking at our growth and achievement across reading, uh, again, Flossburg Hills, uh, 54th percentile in the fall, 59th in the winter. Uh, so definitely uh, for all of our schools, Heather, 41st in the fall, 49th in the winter. Uh, different level of growth, uh, but still, uh, for the most part, growth all around. Uh, we did have a slight dip at Serena and a slight dip at Serena in reading. One thing to note, and this is just goes back to uh, wanting to make sure that we're touching on achievement as well as growth. If you notice, Heather Hill had the highest percentage points of growth in reading, um, and the, the achievement may not be uh, the highest of all of our schools, but they had more to grow. So they had the highest growth and just needs to continue uh, to pull the achievement up. So just stressing the point that all schools are starting off at different points, and it's really about the growth as well as the achievement. What we'd like to see, ideally, is that in the spring, this level of growth continues or corrects where we didn't see enough growth, um, and that we see the majority of our schools and our grade levels as well sitting well in that 61st to 80th percentile. So with Heather Hill, I'm sorry, Heather, um, Serena Hill, um, is the, uh, or should I say, are the number of students that are bilingual, is that number stagnant or is it increasing? And is that a potential contributing factor to the reading um, because of the bilingual students? Possibly. Um, to answer your first question, our numbers are pretty steady. Um, I'm not sure of, like, of exact numbers of recent enrollments, uh, but right now Western and Heather Hill have our highest number of our, our, EL stu our students who participate in the, the English Language Learners Program. Um, in terms of the, the impact, um, absolutely a, a contributing factor. I don't know that I would say definitively whether that is um, the like the only the main contributing factor and the, the reason I and thank you the reason I ask that is that I'm wondering if we had um, teachers or more teachers or more staff that were bilingual would that actually bring about any change that's what that's kind of what I'm getting at absolutely it's it's a healthy wondering it's certainly um, something that benefits students and as in our, our full-time uh, TB our, our uh, bilingual program, one of our bilingual programs at Serena. It's helpful to have. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Moving ahead to looking at our ECRA data. Uh, so our, we've been using ECRA for a few years now. Um, <clears throat> what we want to start to look towards is the programs and the uh, additional things that we're putting in place to support students academically, we want to start seeing uh, higher than expected growth. So for example, a, a specialist or AVID program, um, we want, that's an add-on program. It's supporting students on top of their core instruction. So as we progress in the school year, we want to see that data get high in the greens and then eventually blue. So just looking at our ECRA charts, you can see here the definitions for each of the charts. Now walk through just our overall for each school. So for mathematics, uh, you can see our number of students, the percent met benchmark. That percent met, met benchmark is different than the MAP benchmark. That is ECRA's prediction for, uh, of the students who tested that we had a growth score for. Uh, that is the percent of students that ECRA predicts to meet or exceed on the state assessment. So the Illinois Assessment of Readiness for Math and then also for Reading. So that's sort of our, our mid-year projector or predictor for uh, how students should perform. So we know that we want our students to perform higher, so we have to have conversations now about course corrections. What are we going to do to help bump that up? Because we want students to ultimately score higher on the state assessments. Then we can see the percent breakdowns for students at high growth, expected growth, low growth, and then their overall effect size score. For the most part, on our winter uh, ECRA charts for any of our grade levels and our programs, we're mostly going to see green because it's the middle of the year. So uh, 0.0 green is the, the basic expected growth. 
Then you're going to see, as the school year project pro continues, uh, you'll see plus or minus numbers. Plus means students ex in that group exceeded uh, the projection. Minus just means that, doesn't mean they regressed, it just means that they fell short of meeting that projection. It's helpful for us to know those two clarifications. Looking also at reading, again, for each school, the percent of students who met benchmark, that means the Eckridge prediction for how those students will perform on the state assessments, and then the growth effect size. Again, when we come back in spring is where we really want to dig into how those growth effect size scores changed because um, we'll have a full year to know if what we did uh, met our expectations. And then also by grade level. For reading and for math. So one thing that I think is helpful to know. Um, so if we look at, uh, for example, the third row of, or third column of uh, Eckers projected students to meet the benchmark. If we compare that to last year, for example, um, at Western Avenue, just as an example, uh, on the actual IER assessment, we had 42% of students who met or exceeded state standards. So if we go back to where, and that's in math, if we go back to what ECRA is telling us now, based on how our students performed in, on the winter assessment, they're predicting that we should be at 57%. Little bit minus, little bit plus on the state assessments. That's how we should look at this data. Emma Bill, out of curiosity, I'm, just, I'm trying to remember this. Um, maybe the superintendent can remind me. Science, when's that coming? Or is that, is that not going to be? Uh, state it? science assessment? Yeah, or? It's, it's fifth and eighth grade. When? Fifth and eighth grade, we already eighth, take it. It's a state test at the end of the year. Okay. Yes, it will be included in our, our summative designation. Uh, we don't give uh, assessments in science that are part of this data. Okay. This data is reading and math only. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Dr. Crawford, the, the number that you just mentioned um, around the percentages, um, was that relative to expected um, proficiency or expected growth uh, relative to the IR? Uh, so I, I think I understand your question. Uh, what I mentioned in the third column here, that is expected percent of students who will meet or exceed on the IAR assessment for that subject. So not necessarily for their growth, growth. For their own growth percentile? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, this is telling us that, uh, for example, sixth grade students are projected to be at 34% meeting or exceeding on the state assessment. Not the growth, the, the achievement, Dr. Children. So the growth is represented in columns four, five, and six, and then obviously by the effect size. The third column is each student's achievement in relation to meeting or exceeding the current state benchmark. Compared to themselves or kids like them, correct? correct. Yep. Yes. So yes. if a typical student continues on that trajectory, yes, they will meet or exceed on IAR, and then, you know, depending on where they were, their growth yes. would represent, et cetera. Moving ahead and looking at some of our programs, I wanted to make sure that we came back to this. Uh, this is where ECRA gives us some insights into the different programs that we're doing and their effectiveness. Again, it's, I stress again, it's winter, so this is a small part of our school year. When we come back in the spring, we can see the totality of the impact of those programs. Uh, but what we want to see uh, as the school year progresses is a difference in uh, students, for example, who participated in ACE and their growth score compared to students who did not, who were in like students. Um, also, uh, this is where we would track math interventionists, reading interventions, AVID, programs like that, some of those SR3 uh, programs that we've invested in. I'm going to hand it over to Jackie Janicki and we'll discuss the Ames Web Assessments. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, can you get this? All right, so we, it's pretty hard, I'm so sure I have to hold it. Looking at our Aims Web data this year, we did a little bit differently the way that we tested students. So we benchmarked all of our kindergarten students for um, fall and winter. However, in our grades one through eighth, we just looked at the students that scored below the national norm from their grade level on fall map. So we were targeting students um, that did not meet that in fall. That data shows that um, less students in grades one through eight are currently in tier three map as compared to the fall, which we'll go through in just a moment. And with our kindergarten students too, we are seeing that there is a nice increase in our tier one students, um, a nice movement from math and reading. So we'll go look at that. So again, thinking about what those different indicators are. In tier one, means that those students are at a low risk for not meeting standards. Tier two, at a moderate risk, and then tier three, at a high risk. So we always wanna see the percentages of students going much higher for tier one, and we wanna see the percentages going lower for tier two and tier three. So looking at our fall to winter for mathematics, as you can see, kindergarten made some great growth. If you read it going straight across, um, we went from 46% in the green to 66 in the winter. And then again, we're seeing that um, those benchmark or the percentage of students at each of those levels have gone down when we look at our moderate and our high risk. So we see a nice movement there. And that is pretty consistent um, for kindergarten in reading and math. And then first grade, second, third, fourth through eighth, those were the students that we targeted that are considered more of our tier two students and then our tier three and special education students also. So when looking at them, they're um, taking that benchmark, we see that there also was some really great growth uh, with the tier one students, 41% compared to 30 for first grade, 17 to 42, 23 to 45, and then um, 39 to 45. And then for fifth grade, again, 45 to 56%. And then you can see the different tiers of tier two and tier three have gone down. Excuse me, so okay. yes. go, go, go back. Of course. So tier three is the one and I'm really trying to understand. Sure. Kindergarten, 30% in the fall. Mm -hmm. Then the first grade at 51. Mm -hmm. Then in second grade, 60%. Right, that's how they started. That was the percentage when they came in. And that's a lot of summer, I mean, there's summer loss, a little regression and things that happen there. Also, we want those numbers, so that was 30%, but now if you see there's 14%. So they moved pretty significantly um, students out of that tier. And thank you. So is that, I'm gonna use this word, but is that kind of expected, are those percentages something that's not surprising? It's not surprising because in kindergarten as you're coming in and you're learning those skills and you're learning to read, um, the teachers hit that very hard, obviously those first semester of school. So it's a really, we would expect to see that definitely. Okay, and my last question. So if we hypothetically had a pre-K program, could we see those numbers actually again go lower all the way down that line. I know as we have, we'd have to start all, to follow right, a cohort. To have a larger pre-K program. Okay. We, we do have a pre-K program, but you mean a larger Correct. one. Correct. Okay, could be. I mean, I think that statistically and looking at any early intervention that you can do for students is always going to improve achievement. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So again, um, the area that we do need to focus, again, is looking at some areas within the middle school and looking at the mathematics. So we did have some increases in that low risk for sixth grade and seventh grade. Eighth grade, we did see a decline in that. So we definitely want to focus in, on, that inter on those interventions and really looking at targeting those students. And then the same for tier two, we had a little movement there, but we did have um, eighth grade went down in tier two, but as you can see, they went up in tier three. So that's definitely still an area that we need to focus. Just one quick question. Sure. You said you, uh, the numbers reflect those students that tested to be low? Right, so the students that did not meet their fall uh, 
did not meet the fall benchmark. And what was the rationale for isolating that group? So we really thought that there's a lot with adding the um, map in the winter, that there's so much testing that's being done, which is very valuable. However, really to target those students, if you have a student that's you know, high achievement, doing really well, they're really just taking the test to take the test with AIMSWeb because it's really targeting those basic skills and looking at reading fluency, letter sound, math concepts, math fluency. We know those students have that if they're able to achieve that benchmark in fall math. So we don't want them to have to be belaboring that and having to take that benchmark. So that's really the reasoning kind of behind taking that out and just looking at those tier two and tier three students. So they don't actually take the test at all? They do not now. If they tested, if they met that target in the fall, we did not have them test um, Ames Web at all. Okay. All right. Where was I here? Okay, we did that one. So for reading, again, we see some nice movement. Kindergarten, though, we did test all students, so just know that reflects all the students. And I also have the number of students for each tier, if, if you want to follow up on that, just to see how many kids were in that percentage. Uh, for first grade, we saw some nice growth there, really all the way through, uh, and definitely some decline in tier three, but tier three for reading for K through five, we did see some of that, um, not as much of a difference as we move forward. So that definitely is still a target for us in looking at those interventions. But still really nice growth. But yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. still, yep. still really well. Okay. Then for, um, for sixth grade, we did go up for winter in seventh and in eighth for the green. And then we did see some nice movement to um, as far as our tier two and our tier three, we did see kids go down in sixth grade for tier three, up a little bit, but it's about two or three kids when you look at it that way. So, and you know, Cam's gonna <laughs> love that part. So just looking at that, we did see some nice movement, but again, our really our focus in moving forward is to really continue using this tool as a progress monitoring tool because we are using it to help us continue to monitor those students that are in intervention. It's a valuable tool to really get those um, every other week or every week to see where they're growing um, on those basic skills. And then again, reviewing our reading interventions that we have in sixth grade and through eighth grade and determining you know, what we need to do possibly differently. And then also, um, continuing to look at interventions, oops, on a whole for kindergarten through eighth grade to make sure that we're seeing that student growth. So we will run these same assessments again in the spring right. and look at the three different testing cycles for the same group of students. Yes. But what expectation in terms from fall to winter we saw a decrease, what's the expectation for spring? So we want to continue to see that there are more students obviously meeting um, in that tier one. So when we look at tier one, oh, I don't have the percentages on there. Again, we're looking at the students that are the 80th percentile and above. So we're looking at those kids as we wanting more students to be at that level. Am I answering your question correctly? <laughs> yes, but we'll also test the entire group of kids in the spring. We will not. We so will we, not. So no. we're only going to test the kids who are beginning of the year not meeting grade level. Right. Okay, my, my question is really simple. Um, we brought winter testing back this year, and we're also working with, I think I'm saying it's right, ECRA? Okay. Yes. So, as administration and staff, are we finding that those are beneficial? It's an overall question. Yeah, so uh, just to address both points, um, I think the, what we're finding is that bringing, we were doing the winter Ames web assessment previously. So the test that we brought back was the winter map assessment. Uh, I think that has been extremely beneficial uh, to drive data conversations with teachers uh, while we have time to do something about the data versus just doing it in the spring and it's over and the kids are gone. 
Um, so I think we will continue in that fashion um, because I think the principals would say also those conversations have been very beneficial. The ECRA data as well um, is, is really helpful for leadership to understand where their buildings are, where their students are, and to share that data with teachers uh, so that teachers have an understanding of how students are growing. So I would say yes and yes. Both of those decisions have been extremely beneficial. And we're learning more with ECRA every year and, and growing with it. So my question with regards to the testing for students, are we talking about students in different classes? Are these all, all these students are in the same classroom. How are we leveraging the information we're getting from this data to provide interventions to kids that are in the same classroom? Are you asking specifically about the Ames Lab data? Those that test on grade level and those that don't, that test below grade level. Are these kids in the same classroom? Are they in separate classrooms? Well, within a grade level, potentially. Um, we also, uh, depending on the grade level at the elementary school, we do flexible grouping um, to just encourage that some of those groupings that help with differentiation for students at different levels. Uh, but it really just depends on the grade level. But within, I think if I'm understanding your question, within a range within a grade level, uh, those students could be in the same class, they could not be. So, so my point is, if I'm looking at this from an instructional standpoint, and I'm using this as a formative tool in terms of helping students, if I'm in the same classroom with students that aren't testing and those that are, how am I using this collectively to drive the group forward? Am I doing some separate intervention for those students that took the testing? Mm -hmm. Or am I just lumping them together? So part of the value of Ames Web is that it is a very highly sensitive assessment. It's word calling, letter naming fluency, phonemic awareness, all those different pieces that you can measure on a very sensitive scale, as opposed to the MAP test, which it's a Roush unit. So in, basically, a RIT score is a RIT score is a RIT score. They're comparable across. They both, they serve different purposes. Ames Web is focused on interventions because in theory, we can look back and say, okay, um, a child who's, you know, calling 20 words per minute, we can show that they've increased two words per minute over the last six weeks. Now they're at 32, right? That won't show up on a map test. And so these different data sets are used within a classroom You'll take your winter assessment, everyone takes that. So now, little Dana has information based on his RIT score in math that will chart his path forward, right? It'll give you, the teacher, Michael, you know, these are the skills that are next, these are the ones that are secure, um, these are extension skills. That's for everybody. There's a subset of the, your classroom population that aren't secure in these math skills or these literacy skills that the Ames Web will then say, Okay, we know that for these six or seven students, they're working with a math interventionist, they're working with a reading specialist, they're working with, you know, wind group pull out by another teacher in the building. This, those intervention activities will impact the Ames Web score. So they're used a little bit differently. The Ames Web is used basically to track the effectiveness of intervention. Map would be the effectiveness of your system, classroom, grade level, et cetera. Is that? I understand that. I guess my only question, or my primary question is, if, if I'm correct, we're looking at about 60% of students that are taking this assessment. Is that a reasonable estimate? For Ames Web. For the, the group that we're isolating. Yes. And administering the test to in the winter, that's about 60% of our total student population. Is that accurate? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're fine. So we can bring that back. We'll, we'll bring you the numbers, percentage. Because I don't the want question, to misspeak. So the point is, right. I mean, if, if I'm looking to use a tool as a formative tool, in other words, I'm using this to help me with the student individually in that particular content area. If 60% of my students are separated from the 40% that's testing on grade level, it makes the ability to use this as a formative tool more complicated and much more difficult. So my question is, how are we effectively doing that if we have this separation of students in terms of we're assessments? Not, we're not yeah, I can clarify that. I, there might be a... She just said only 
a select group of students are taking yeah, the winter Yes, but I, I want us to go back to the conversations last year around adding the winter map, particularly our concerns, my concern, about adding the hours of testing. Because we added a minimum of another two hours. Right. So we're up to six hours with map testing. We're sitting somewhere around eight and a half to nine hours with IAR testing. We have kids not coming to school. So when you add all of those up, we're just burning school days without meaningful experiences. When we added the winter map test back, the trade-off was if a student didn't need the Ames web test, we wouldn't make them sit through it. And so that's, that's the difference. The instruction still happens in the classroom. We do flexibly group here and there, but, but the purposeful decision not to Ames web test everyone was trying not to put a kindergartner who can read in front of a test that says, please tell me that you know the letter A, C, R, X, et cetera. So we were trying to be purposeful about how we use that time so that we could reallocate it, frankly, to instruction. So there's any number, I would say, of assessments that we have to use, even depending on intervention, that some subset of students may receive that others won't. Because again, if you can demonstrate a skill, I don't anticipate that the teacher is going to change his or her instructional pathway for you if you just prove it again. Does that make sense? I, can, it, it, it makes maybe sense, I can follow up. We'll, we'll have to. Yeah, can I give you a call? Because I, I just yeah, want to make we'll sure have that. We'll talk about it further later. Okay. I, I, I guess right. my question is it's a significant percent of kids that are taking the assessment again. And the ones that are taking the assessment are kids that have been earmarked as those most in need of increased instructional time. But we're doing just the opposite. They're getting less instructional time because now we're having them spend more time testing than kids who are testing at or above grade level. And that only further complicates the use of the tool as a formative tool for kids. I think the benefit of AmesWeb is that you could, test a, you could test all of Parker in one day. Because again, they're sensitive assessments. They're about one minute. And so depending on the different tests that you're using, whether it's, again, Letter name fluency, phonemic awareness, all those different pieces. I think that's the value. So it's a very sensitive assessment, it has to be quick. And so we can, we can kind of talk about what that instructional impact is. My gut says having the additional information, being able to respond to that in the moment for a student is valuable and would, would be worth the time, but we can certainly mm -hmm. talk to the teachers about that. Yeah, we can talk, but, right. and, and, and I promise I'll be quiet after this. With regards to the Marzano's proficiency scales, I would think that would be a viable means of being informed about where students are standing and how to move forward formatively as opposed to additional testing. Yes, but I just wanted to make one comment too, which Dr. Swiss was saying how sensitive it is, and to talk with your comment too. Progress monitoring students, though, also helps us to see if they're making progress within those different interventions or with even within the classroom. So if students are struggling, it's important that we have the data to be able to see if there are issues in certain areas and we're pinpointing that in our intervention. And two, know that some of these assessments are about a minute to two minutes. They're not lo that lengthy. And so I don't want you to think they're missing a huge amount of instructional time. But. Okay. Yeah, and, and I'm glad that you brought up about the past conversations because we, we went through this about testing and adding and subtract, all of that ad nauseum, which is why I wanted to find out if the board's decision to support us doing this and, and ECRO, ECRO were actually beneficial because the other part about this is that um, as I recall, the students were pushing back to some degree and not wanting to take additional testing. So I think, the, and then the parents were also kind of like, why more tests? And so I think it, it sounds like you guys have found the right mixture of, of who to test and how to test. So I hear what you're, where you're going with this, Michael, but I'm just like I said, that's, I remember we really yeah. spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do this. And you know, this is really good data. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if you objectively look at this data, it's great. All of our trend lines continue to move up. Now that now we are demonstrating year over year growth. I guess my question Period. to that point, um, Dr. 
Doc, is, is really around, is it meeting your expectation? Is it exceeding your expectation from at the beginning of the year? Like you put things in place that you hope, hey, I hope this works, right? Where, where are where the numbers currently stand relative to your expectations um, at the beginning of the year? And your team can answer if you, if you feel like it. Mm -hmm. You know, achievement numbers will handle themselves. We tend to focus more on the growth numbers. Uh, I like to see those above 70%. That would put us in the top 10% of all school districts measured by MAP, right? And so if, just as indicators that we're using, if we can guarantee that every child makes a year's growth, every single child, whether you cannot read in third grade or you are doing algebra in third grade, we need you to grow. As you hear the school improvement presentations, you'll see the response to that particularly around using staff differently, applying data more effectively to the instructional process. The attendance numbers are vexing. But again, I'm thrilled with that. When we had our conversations over the summer, we've, again, we've been talking about this for years, if we can decrease somewhere between five and 7% every year, in a couple of years we're going to catch up. Ideally, we could take that in one step. Doesn't seem likely. Uh, so I'm, I am happy with the work that's being done. You can see that the work is being done. Again, when the building principal is going to talk about their school improvement plans, you can observe this work. And part of it is, are, are we spending our time focused on the right areas? I think the data would show that. Um, this has helped with conversations around the ESSER positions and those funding uh, sources. But even it, it starts to expand to other positions as our as our data warehouse is more complete, we do ask questions about other legacy programs that have existed that may not generate you know, the type of growth that we would like to see. And so I think those will be the challenging conversations for the board as we kind of get into those because as we, we're not waiting for something not to work, essentially. We wanna be able to respond in the moment as much as possible. Now, there's all sorts of guidelines and collective bargaining agreements, all those things, those, those still exist. But I think what you'll see out of the administrative team and the building principals specifically is that, you know, there, is no, there are no sacred cows anymore. And if we have to change a program, if we have to stop a program, if, the, if we have to add a program, we're going to do that to generate great opportunities for kids. So I'm happy with the direction that we're going. I, I'm thrilled by the repeatability of the data what we're seeing year over year, as I've shared with the board, our next step is, you know, we're a small elementary school district. We've got plenty of heroes. I can, I can list the teachers who've generated more than expected growth year over year for their kids. And as we talked a little bit earlier before the meeting, yes. now we're in the process of identifying those skills, identifying those strategies, and replicating them, and removing the chance of, of positive achievement. I think as we get better at that, as we kind of build up uh, some of our amazing teachers who may not want to step into the spotlight but do incredible work for kids, we will have more success not only in our schools and our grade levels but the district completely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both. If I may make a request. Are, okay, there you go. Please. <laughs> We're going to make an adjustment to the agenda. So while we have several other discussion items on the agenda, we're going to skip down to action items, specifically 7B, um, approval of Flossmoor Hills, Heather Hill, and Serena Hill assistant principals, and then we will go back to the discussion items. Absolutely. So this is a long time coming. As we have made changes over the last couple of years, um, as we've thought about the schooling experience differently, we've, we started at Parker, made some uh, initial adjustments with the addition of a dean and assistant principal. But as we've looked at our elementary schools as well, uh, we made a different recommendation. We have moved away from uh, caseworkers that primarily focused on special education. And they've really tried to take a look at what the buildings need um, just from an organizational perspective. Instructional leadership, student support, family support, teacher support, teacher leadership, and all those different areas. So this, again, this process has been going on for probably the last 12 months. We are starting to get to the final resolution of that. We had 
We added an assistant principal at Western Avenue School primarily because of the size. We knew that the other elementary schools would follow. Tonight we have the recommendations uh, for Flossmoor Hills, Heather Hill, and Serena Hills. Uh, we have, we're recommending three official candidates. We have two of them in person. One had a, a family obligation and couldn't join us. Uh, but as a recommendation states, we are uh, recommending uh, Mr. Cameron Small to be the assistant principal at Heather Hill School, uh, Ms. Abby Gerard to be the assistant principal at Flossmoor Hill School, and Ms. Laura DeBasio for the assistant principal position at Serena Hill School. Uh, both Cam and Laura are internal candidates, and uh, we've been able to see their work up close. Abby comes to us uh, from a school district in Moments, um, and after checking every formal, informal background, friends, dog walkers, you name it. Um, uh, we're really excited about these people. This is a miserable process. If you've applied to be an, an administrator here, we screen all of the candidates um, just initially. Then we have an initial screening set of interviews. We have round one of the interviews which, where they have to deliver writing samples and answer questions from teachers and administrators. There's a third round which includes um, a presentation to the administrative team and a simulated coaching session because as I've shared, being an instructional leader and the ability to observe and analyze teaching in the moment to offer coaching and feedback is one of the paramount expectations for a building leader. We don't, anyone can figure out a bus schedule, but can you work with a 20 year veteran who's looking for ideas on classroom management or how to make learning more vibrant in the classroom? So that they make it through the presentation, the simulated coaching session, and then a number of questions after that. Um, and then we really take a hard look at what each building needs, what's going to put our students and teachers and other building leaders in the position for success, and we've landed here. Uh, I'm thrilled that these people are going to join our team. Um, as I've worked with Laura and FCAM for this year, I've seen them connect with children. I've seen them stick their nose into issues that they weren't involved in, but all of a sudden they're helping out with. I've seen them live their commitment to education, not District 161 necessarily, although I do not doubt that, but their commitment to education, their commitment to our community, and their commitment to our success. So I'm really excited to recommend all three of them, obviously the two who are in person tonight. So that was it. Can I make a motion? Yeah. Okay, thank you. May I have a motion to approve Ms. Abby Gerard for the assistant principal position at Flossmoor Hill School, Mr. Cameron Small for the assistant principal position at Heather Hill School, and Ms. Laura DeBasio for the assistant principal position at Serena Hill School, effective July 1st, 2024, according to the terms of their individual contracts. I second that. Oh. So moved. Dang, we're all fighting. I love it. You second that. Yes, can I get in the minutes on that? <laughs> it's Cam. Cam and David, I think. Oh, no, Cam and Christina. Sure. Okay. Oh, sorry, I just seconded. I didn't even okay. first. Oh, call, my, please. I'm tired. No, I was messing around. Let's go. <laughs> you got it. Hmm? Who was the second? Me. Christina. Yep. Roll call. Lanier. Yes. Yes. Childress. Yes. yes. No, she, she's there. I have faith. Hey, Liz, you there? Go on. Let's try. Yes. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to get off of news here. We knew you were there. <laughs> You're older than. Would yes you like, or no? Would you like to vote, though? Oh, yeah. I am voting here. Hey, Liz, you there? I am. Can you guys hear me? We can now. You're up for the roll call vote okay. for, for assistant principals. Voting yes. 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 That's it. Yeah, that's all of us. Okay, and the motion passes. Congratulations. Congratulations, everybody. <laughs> so, just as part of the next steps, Ms. Crawford, Ms. Dr. Marty, Ms. Janicki, myself, we're working on a professional development plan for all of the assistant principals. 
We know that we have very high expectations for them, but we're going to stand right next to them through this process. Everything from inner rate, rate of reliability on evaluations to our expectations on serving students with individualized education plans and 504s. Their training modules will go certainly through into next year, but we'll hit them pretty hard this summer to make sure that they're ready to go. Uh, we're just really excited. Thank you both for being here. Congratulations. Are you taking a picture? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go take a picture. Okay. Yes. Hey, you know what, since you brought family, why don't you have everyone come up and we'll take a picture. Yeah. yeah. I would like that. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it would be nice. They sure did. They deserve it. I just, I sec I second it without even knowing what. You know, I usually yeah. consider my beauty a challenge anyone named Pink Cam to teach a strength. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I mean, no. I just there has to come with the best of it. was only last thing, right? No, I seconded that motion before it even had a motion. Right. Yeah, but it's your first time. I'm trying to say it. Kept everyone waiting. Yeah, I'm not sure I was waiting. Well, we got that parliamentarily we, we uh, appropriate thing. We have another two hours. I had I had no, said she had to go get the girls. Are we though? I'm, I'm not asking questions. Are we? Are you though? Yes. yes. Okay. I mean, there was an hour and forty-five minutes of basic talk. I predict we have at least. One. I would say. I think you can keep that in that area. Congratulations, everyone. All right. Thank you for being so great. And thank you. After yeah. Intermission, who's in for a couple more hours? All right. We only have like three hours. Oh, see? I should have brought a snack. I said two. Maybe two. Maybe two. Maybe two. Are you going court? I'll be good when I can go home. I just have to also, stuff is happening. Mid-year. Okay. So I'm going to go back. Now. Yep. Thank yep. You yes. Being... Thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I felt terrible. Bye, That's everybody. Right. see you guys. Okay. We are going to proceed um, on the agenda to discussion item D. 2023-24 mid-year school improvement plan updates. Yes, we're going to start with Parker. Oh, no, please feel free to walk on up. We, we welcome uh, Ms. Ursula Paris, principal at Parker Junior High School. Good evening. Good evening. Good it's evening. great to be here. It's we're great glad to see you. you. Great to have you. Great to be here. Great to see you. Um, Ursula Paris, proud principal of Parker Junior High School, here to give an update on our SIT plan. We'll start with culture and climate. Some of these pieces were already mentioned earlier, but I just want to emphasize some of the great things that are happening at Parker. First of all, our daily advisory lessons are going extremely well with our sixth and seventh and eighth graders able to connect with uh, teachers every day. They have a teacher advocate that they can meet with to discuss and do lessons centered on establishing values, resolving conflict, empathy, affirmations, and goal setting. Also, our PBIS is going extremely well. 
I'd like to recognize Ms. Felicia who joined us today for our kickball staff scholar. Amazing today. I was just supposed to be a volunteer <laughs> and not participate, but. But it was awesome and we have a picture to prove it. Uh, <laughs> But our PBS focus is for our scholars to be respectful, responsible, and ready to learn. We also have monthly goals that we're working towards. Our scholars have an opportunity to use their digital Falcon Bucks to make purchases every Friday in our lunch area. And like I said, we had our staff scholar games based upon a focus, whether it's making sure we reduce the number of referrals for defiance or reduce the number of referrals for physical aggression. And so we want to make sure we reward our scholars for that. And then we also have PBS game day. Most recently, we had about 80 scholars to stay after school just to play like games, like tossing the bag and sitting down in a circle, talking with their teachers, and they absolutely love it. Uh, MTSS, I'm proud to say that we sh we've shown a 15% increase in a number of scholars that have zero referrals from last year to this year, 10% uh, decrease in a number of scholars receiving six or more referrals compared from last year to this year. And we attribute that to collaborative discussions and with our grade level teams focusing on those scholars that have challenging um, behaviors with attendance or grades. We have regular sessions with our teachers that center on what scholars need additional support via check in, check out, behavior plans, our SAG groups, um, increase in contact with staff throughout the school day. And we have to mention our PASS program, which has been a tremendous success for our scholars this year. In the area of instruction, we, we are focusing on regular scheduled PLCs that center on, most recently we had a, a staff session on small group instruction, excuse me, small group instruction, differentiated instruction, so that we can reach those bubble scholars, those scholars we just talked about that are marginal for showing projected proficiency on the IER. Actually, also, um, sharing with our teachers how to access data reports via from MAP, our, our winter MAP assessment data. So teachers aren't spending a whole lot of t more time on pulling the data, but more time spent on the instruction. And also with our Marzano proficiency scale, so our scholars are able to rate themselves on what was learned throughout those individual lessons. And then achievement gap, uh, making sure that we address those scholars. We are planning to start our IAR tutoring after school. We finally identified some reading uh, math tutors for this plan, which will address those bu bubble scholars I just mentioned. We're also having our teacher data chats, school-wide data chats over map data, individual data chats with teachers, and we're noticing that some areas to celebrate, we're scoring much better in operations and algebraic thinking from, from math. And our focus over the next couple of weeks leading up to IER is literary and informational text. And so we're meeting with our social studies team so that we can include some lesson strategies to address those areas, and of course, our ELA teachers on literary and informational text. And as uh, Ms. Crawford mentioned earlier, we're continuing to do professional development on building teacher efficacy. We want to make sure we have great lesson planning happening in the classroom, commend our teachers for being great communicators, and make sure we are implementing effective lesson strategies. And that concludes my Parker report. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for doing the um, literary extra help because I know my scholar struggles there. <laughs> That's all. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Paris. I, I got a really quick question for you, really quick question. Um, and it's just an observation from social media. Um, it appears that Parker is really doing well um, with some of his ex extracurricular activities, in particular sports. Um, which one is driving it? Is, is it the culture that's driving it or they're kind of driving the culture? Because I think it's really wonderful and I'm hoping that that continues to grow. That's a good, that's a good, that's a really good question. I'll let Ms. Parents kind of respond from a school perspective, but as we've talked, you know, there's a clear connection between extracurricular participation, GPA, attendance, graduation rates, future earning, all those different pieces. 
So uh, we've really tried to increase that. The fruits have not been seen yet because we're still in the middle of that. But I ideally, we find a spot for every child who wants to participate in an activity because Ms. Paris shared 80 kids, you know, 11, 12, 13 year olds playing games on an afternoon at a middle school is not typical. The stronger those bonds, the stronger that school community. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that as well. Yeah, in addition to that, we have to remember not just athletics, but other clubs and activities like Crochet Club, right. Dungeons and Dragons. We have scholars coming to us wanting to make proposals. And it's, the key is just to make sure there's a connection outside of the social studies, outside of the math classrooms. So I think it's a combination thereof that's driving the increase in the culture. Okay, and, and, and the reason I ask that question is because I see it. It's just an observation, and I, I'm not there to make the connection about which one's driving which. But back to Cam's point about you know what is it that can be done, and back to Trey's point about again you know, we've got to try to find ways to go ahead and and put feet back in the building. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that's something. I'm not saying what it is mm -hmm. or which programs, but is that sure. something to to at least look at? Oh yeah. We are currently, uh, I will say, as I've uh, shared with the board in, in some of my most recent updates over the last few months, as I meet with individual student groups, that's one question. What gets you here after school? I will tell you, so many of our kids already participate in a sport, instrument, you name it. But all of them were still willing. To, I said, if, you know, if we had an after school club that you were interested in, would you still join? Would you still try to do that? And they said yes. Everything from crochet club, as uh, Ursula mentioned, Dungeons and Dragons, Girls on the Run, Boys on the Run, Volunteer Club, um, an opportunity for young girls to do each other's hair because there may not be anyone else at home. Uh, handyman's Club, I mean, you name it, there are ideas. If we're creative enough, we can figure that out. The boards give will be the money. And so I think as we've uh, sought authority moving forward with um, contract negotiations and some of those things, that is certainly a priority for us providing more opportunities for teachers to, hey, I do want to try this club. I'm not sure if it's going to work, but I might get eight kids. Great, go try it. Let's see what happens, and then let's see what the information says. So that's a good, really good question. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Hills. Next up is Flossmore Hills. How are you, Ms. McNeil Dobson? Hi, good evening, Dr. Smith good to see and you. the members of the school board. Uh, I am Avita McNeil Dobson, and I am the proud principal of Flossmore Hills. Um, so uh, this year, Flossmore Hills has been working extremely hard uh, to meet the goals that we put in place at the beginning of the year for our SIP plan. Um, and so starting with our culture and climate goal, we wanted to make sure that we included student voice in our goals this year. And so the five essentials data showed um, from last year that students did not feel safe in the hallways and in the restrooms. So the team thought that if we brought our third through fifth grade students together uh, to discuss expectations and have students help develop the social contracts for the hallways and the restrooms, uh, they would take more ownership as well as accountability uh, for their behavior. Um, and so what we did was have an assembly with our third through fifth grade students uh, led by the teachers and we took their input in regards to what they needed to feel safe in the hallways and in the restrooms uh, in the school. Um, so we talked about what it looks like to be respectful and we talked about what the expectations look like for those areas. Uh, the students gave us input and we displayed those social contracts in the third through fifth grade hallways. Um, I believe that in addition to the other CKH components that we are implementing, adding that student that component of student voice into our uh, social contracts has led to Foster Hills recently being nominated as a CKH a National Showcase a School, and we are very excited about that. Um, in addition to CKH, we also have PBIS expectations that we teach to our students in lessons that we call cool tools on a monthly basis, and then students are then um, provided monthly incentives and celebrations for demonstrating the positive behavior um, throughout the school, specifically in those hallways and those restrooms. Uh, moving on to instruction, 
we have implemented flexible groups based on the fall and the winter data to help us better target and focus uh, the needs of our students. So we also have really been leaning into the work and the professional development around proficiency skills and student ratings. The math standards are at the core of our PLC discussions. The teachers are talking about what students need to be able to demonstrate in order to uh, show that they have learned and mastered the concept. Um, all the classrooms have the learning standards posted in addition to the I can statements. And then a really uh, big impact that we think has altered our data this year is the students being able to rate themselves, themselves on a scale of one to four. So students being able to understand that this is what I need to be able to do to demonstrate this standard and actually having an idea of where their understanding may be going wrong so that the teacher can then target that help them reteach and guide the instruction we think is really really huge uh, for our school um, lastly focusing on the achievement gap uh, has been making sure that we are targeting uh, our interventions and problem solving and team meetings to better understand our student deficits and how we can help them and additionally, as a motivating factor for our students uh, that participate in Tier 2 and Tier 3 instruction, uh, we began a program this year called Books and Basketball. And so that is a tool to help, an incentive rather, to help our struggling students get rewarded for meeting their goals. And so um, in order to be rewarded, those Tier 2 and Tier 3 students, uh, they are they have to show growth on their weekly progress monitoring data. They have to turn in a reading log, and then specifically for our uh, grades four and five students, they have to achieve at least a 75% 75, 75 um, goal on their uh, Achieve 3000 um, test. So, um, and then of course, if they meet those goals, once a month they are rewarded uh, with a incentive from the reading specialist uh, to further motivate them to, to meet their goals. So uh, we think that those are things that, are, that we're doing, um, implementing at our school to help our students uh, reach their goals. Um, and that concludes my, my report. Any questions? So I, I just want to say um, congratulations on the Captain Kids Heart. Thank you. To good luck. Um, please let us know how that turns out. Um, it sounds as if the building leadership team is doing a great job with that. So again, congratulations, I tip my hat. Um, again, I keep thinking about what we can do differently with the, the chronic absenteeism. And as you were giving your presentation, I thought about what one of the things was. So when I was younger, and that was a long time ago, um, it was a big deal to get um, a perfect attendance sheet at the end of the year or when, you, when the grades came out to see all those zeros, like I was there every day and mom and dad were great about that. Do we still do any of that anymore or is that just passe? Well, so at Flossmore Hills, that's not something that we've been doing, implementing perfect attendance awards. Um, in our efforts to um, curtail the absenteeism that's happening in the school, we are thinking of additional incentives and rewards for students participating in fun activities, glow parties, uh, after school activities. Uh, we're thinking about giving the kids, you know, um, Lou, Malnati, Lou Malnati's cards and um, uh, Portillo's cake cards and gift cards and things. So um, that's not not an incentive that we have uh, brainstormed, but certainly one that I can take back to the team. The, the unintended consequence of that is kids coming to school sick. <laughs> Explain. Because I gotta get perfect attendance. I'm not sick, I'm not. I don't have a fever, I'm not coughing, I didn't throw up, I've gotta go, my teachers expect me to be there. And that's what we uh, saw um, when, it is an unintended consequence. I'm not Ms. saying don't do it, but I'm just saying that's, a side effect. I, I would love to highlight one of the things that I think is really important as a biased, completely biased parent of Flossmore Hills <laughs> is the articulation of how a student is progressing on their own learning. Like when a student can say, hey, I'm supposed to learn these things and here's where I am on those these things and here's where I need help 
and or assistance when they can begin to advocate for themselves in that way, which she has illuminated, I think, is, is probably the greatest gift that we can give our students is agency and advocacy, right? And so I think that by doing that at the elementary level only, inspires our students when they get to older ages to be able to say I'm in charge of this it's not you doing this to me for me or anything it's like I know what I need to do I know how I need to navigate and that's not something that I mean I know we try to give it to our kids but it's something that the school actually engineers for you um, ownership Mm -hmm. Man, it's it's beautiful. I mean, it's it's the greatest thing I think ever, and it's not something that I. I mean, it's kind of the hidden gem I think in your speech, um, and I appreciate you. Thank you again. I'm biased on a thousand different levels, but I want to say when my child comes home and says, "Hey, yo, I need some help on this thing in this way." Here's where my misunderstanding is, and I just, "Hey, come on and sit down." But I don't need you to read the whole thing. I just, here's my whole, th like this, this right here, I'm not getting. And he can articulate it for himself. Man, I, I would want that thing to happen for every child. If there's anything I could ever do is that moment right there. And whatever we do as a district, as a board, that students care enough to be able to have those kind of conversations that your culture is creating. Um, would make all of this worthwhile. So I just want to thank you for the work that you and your team are doing. I know that's not happening in isolation to you. I know it's happening in other spaces, mm -hmm. but your articulation of it um, is just very, very beautiful. And I want to thank you publicly. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Childress. And I like to say that that, that work of the Marzano coaching that our teachers receive, the professional development. When I say Flossmoor Hill staff, they are really leaning into it. They are soaking it up. They want to hear what the Marzano coach has to say. How can they push themselves and their students to rise to those high expectations of the work that we are doing? And so the rating is happening from kindergarten all the way up to fifth grade. I mean, I invite you to come on out. I mean, you can walk into a kindergarten class, a third grade class, or fifth fifth grade class and you ask the students after a lesson, where where do you feel like you are today? How do you rate yourself according to this standard? And they can articulate and tell you, well, I'm a two because I know how to do this, this, and this, but I still need a little help with, 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 with this concept here. And then you check in a few days later and they're able to um, progress with their rating and say, well, I'm a three or I'm a four. And that is directly correlated to the work that the district is doing around Marzano and the coaching that the teachers are receiving. How long have we had Marzano? I haven't started this year. This, this, is this work year. is in preparation for standards-based <laughs> reporting and grading. I feel like I remember when Mrs. Reich started at Serena, I think that was the first year that I'd seen the, um, that ownership that you were talking about, the um, self um, reporting, self-actualization of what, mm -hmm. and students, student-led uh, conferences is really how she started it, and that was fantastic, because you have your ownership of what you're doing and having responsibility of that in the classroom, so th this is only an added tool to, I can see what, what I had personally been through with my kids. So. Thank you. Thanks. I still want to bring perfect attendance back. What's that? I still want to bring per per a perfect attendance back. So, <laughs> and I, we, we, we should have asked our representative who is here. It's hard to have perfect attendance when the state board says you can miss five days. That's right. Yeah. I that's get it. It's just. Uh, it's yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, that, that and the Book It Pizza Hut. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Bring Book It back. Hello. Very motivated. Hello. Good evening, members of the board. Dr. Smith. Good morning. It's good to see good everyone. Good evening. <laughs> it's not morning. It's I know. It's been a long night. <laughs> it has. It has. <laughs> All right. Well, I am so excited to come before you today and uh, represent the Heather Hill team who's been working so incredibly hard on our school improvement goals and plans, um, which we are seeing um, great gains and growth. Um, towards that. So starting with a culture and climate, um, really focusing on the implementation of a variety of Capturing Kids Heart strategies, including our monthly focus areas. So for example, February is the month of kindness. So we have kindness challenges happening right now. 
Um, implementing um, routines such as social contracts, four questions, and uh, step consequences to really have that, those clarity of expectations across the building and really work through those consistent, consistent routines and procedures as, in relationship to both capturing kids' hearts as well as our PBIS um, implementation. And I'm very excited to share, along with Wasmore Hills, Heather Hill has also been nominated as a Capturing Kids Heart Showcase, National Showcase School. So we are very excited to work towards that process and are in the final stages of implementing um, evidence on that. In addition to that, we wanted to make sure that students were really included in the process. And so we have worked this year to have students generate ideas for PBIS celebrations to provide further motivation and encouragement on following those um, expectations. And we've also seen some really great gains in that area, especially um, in some of the transitions and, and uh, similar bathroom areas as well, um, that we've had uh, lots of discussions and collaboration with students to understand the best ways to move forward and we've seen um, great, great gains in those areas. And then our buddy classrooms has been a great way to continue to build community across the school. We've paired classrooms, uh, lower grade level with higher grade level classrooms, and there are monthly activities happening. Sometimes it's reading together, sometimes it's writing, sometimes it's math games, um, sometimes it's a fun activity just to be able to build those connections and community across the entire building. And we've seen a lot of, a lot of fun activities happening throughout that process. In the area of instruction, We've focused a lot on NWA MAP Learning Continuum for targeted instruction, taking a look at what are specific areas of skill that need to be focused on in small group um, and whole group. We know that writing every day is an important connection for students to be able to build their literacy skills. Um, it's research proven. <laughs> the more that students write, the better they will do um, in literacy and reading um, and vice versa. Uh, we are also maximizing any and all opportunities for reading, trying to increase the amount of minutes that students have eyes on text throughout the day because we know the importance of uh, that text and comprehension. We've been working on computational fluency with a focus on accuracy, efficiency, and flexibility. And really, again, focusing on that work that Ms. McNeil Debson already mentioned uh, regarding I can statements um, and Marzano proficiency scales. We've spent a lot of time supporting um, teachers and students, working together and understanding what students are learning and why, really focusing on that clarity piece of expectations. And we've also done that through professional uh, learning communities to develop our math backwards design. So really taking a look at that end goal assessment and working backwards to say, what are our highest priority standards? Relate, correlating those to the Marzano proficiency scales and promoting that within the classroom to do the student self ratings that we talked about. And we've seen our ratings morph over time from just a one, two, three, and four of how do I feel and, and we're really working now on targeting towards that specific instruction in the proficiency scale of what does that mean when I say that I'm a two and looking at the language in the scale to clarify that and then moving up through the different levels. So we're excited to see our growth there. And then finally for the achievement gap, taking a look at our attendance routines, we've already talked about as a district our, our goals and efforts to um, send home letters, make phone calls, um, really, really helping to work with that homeschool connection on how we determine root causes of absences and exploring, we're looking at new strategies and to help motivate students to attend. Um, our uh, assessment team recently met to discuss ways in which we could promote uh, additional motivational strategies, especially as we're getting closer to our uh, testing um, period and, and how we motivate students to uh, be a part of our, our daily routine. And then flexible grouping, uh, third through fifth grade, um, it's particularly in math, we've seen some great gains and um, are looking forward to continuing that trend. Uh, teachers working collaboratively towards not only the math plans, but instructional strategies across the building. And then those weekly letters home, again, for that homeschool connection, um, providing templates to teachers so that students can really share their learning with their parents and what that looks like. And we've even had so much as I know particularly one teacher has encouraged parents to write back to their students and provided incentives to do so. So that's been a really neat uh, connection to see. 
best part of parenting was my Friday letter <laughs> right? that I got uh, from Mrs. Selsky in fourth grade. Right, because without that, you yep. may not know what happened throughout the week. I know asking my own children can be very difficult. <laughs> Any questions? Thank Any you. Questions for some? Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Appreciate Thank it. you. Next, we welcome Miss Wright. Good welcome. evening, everyone. How are you? How is everybody? Excellent. Hello. We're hanging in there. We're hanging in. All right. All right. We're going to do this. So, the Serena Hills highlights of our SIP plan for this year, for this midpoint in our year. Um, First, attacking climate and culture. We're doing learning walks across the building. It's kind of tapping into what Ms. Crawford touched on for that collective teacher efficacy. We're better together than we are apart. We learn from each other and together our practices grow from there. So our teams are pairing up. They're visiting each other's classrooms, offering feedback to each other of things that they see in the classroom visually, practices that they're using to teach certain subject matters and using different methodology and sharing those ideas and resources amongst themselves so we get better together. Yeah. Um, the evolution of our Community Connections Committee. Um, recently, our Community Connection Committee has gotten some community volunteers in, so we've got some community members joining the team. Um, the team to plan our Black Culture Night this year sent out a survey to the community to see what they wanted to see that night to look like. And so based upon that feedback, they've planned our event on the 29th. Um, we're gonna have vendors and some activities and our wax museum and things like that, oh. all based upon the community's feedback of what they'd like to see and visit and have that evening look like. Um, this year we are doing uh, PBIS assemblies at the beginning of the month with a focused skill or area that might need a little bit more attention. This month it's uh, respect and greeting and please and thank you and using our manners things like that. And then at the end of the month, for those children who have met the goal of not having three reflections, three minor uh, <coughs> referrals, or a major referral, they're invited to our PBIS assembly. Um, the December one was super fun. It was a rock, paper, scissors contest. Oh, wow. Kids got to hop through hula hoops together and meet, play a quick game of rock, paper, scissors. Whoever won stayed in, met the next student from the classroom, whoever got out, got out. Super, it was a lot of fun. Um, and then in January, we had a dance party because our musician, I mean, our magician kind of went south right as he arrived. So we spun quickly. Then in the area of instruction, we're continuing our data, uh, student data binders. Now with the map results from the winter, we have a touch point for math for uh, teachers to meet with their students, set new goals, reflect on the growth that they've made thus far, and look forward to the spring of what new growth they want to look forward to, what uh, ways their teachers and their can support them, the ways students can support themselves, et cetera. Um, much like the other schools, we're focusing on daily writing. Um, we're using race, meso race methodology, that's restate, answer, cite, and provide your evidence. Uh, that was a quiz for me, I think, just then. <laughs> um, and also focusing on different methodology that the students will see on the IAR test, not just narrative writing, but literary analysis and research simulation. So the kids are familiar with those types of writing before they enter state testing and will be confident and prepared for their, um, uh, for the test. Additionally then, like the other buildings also, we're diving deep into the Marzano proficiency scales. Um, we are right now focusing on math, but also my, my staff is kind of chomping at the bit for ELA, Mrs. Crawford. Everybody, all the teachers, they kind of want to just dig in in both subject areas. So what we're doing in ELA is we're focusing on Walt statements and ICANN statements. We are learning two, and then that's the broad um, goal of what the lesson is going to be about, and then specifically the ICANN, what the students will be able to actualize at the end of the lesson. So they know what they're learning and why they're learning it and what they're looking forward to assessing themselves on how they've learned that. Um, very much the same way the students are assessing themselves on that one through four scale. Um, you'll see lots of post-it notes around our building. I'm sure you'll see it at the other buildings too where the kids are posting. Um, they draw a picture on the front and then they put their name on the back and they post one through four on the, on the wall. And then the teacher can go and peek underneath and see who's at the different levels. But it's private then, at least so nobody knows where you are. But the teacher can assess very quickly where the students believe their um, achievement is at. 
then in the achievement gap area, we are using high impact literacy and math strategies. That's through flexible grouping. We're doing flexible grouping for ELA and for math. In ELA, if you are um, a group with lower cheered students, a reading specialist is pushing in to co-teach at least a portion of that uh, instructional block with you. And then in math, uh, we're also using those proficiency scales and really diving into that. Then paired with that, the reading and computation fluency practices, which you've heard from the other buildings as well, really working on that oral fluency um, because the fact we need the students to be reading at a pace where they're successful, not only because it helps them have the text make sense to them, because if you're reading too choppy, it's tough to carry the meaning of that story. Mm. So you wanna increase their fluency so it sounds like speech and the children can carry the meaning of that story. Additionally, a lot of the things that we do in our, uh, for assessing our students is timed. So we wanna make sure that they have the tools that they need in order to be successful on the various assessments that we give. Um, I think I have read all my little jotted notes for myself. Any questions? Thank you for uh, addressing, um, oh my gosh, uh, manners. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's important. Yes. We're getting lots more co eye contact too. It's fabulous in the morning. <laughs> yeah. You know, when, when, when each of the principals stands before me, I see something a little different. And so was Serena, yeah, it might be, yeah. So with Serena, whenever I see Serena, I think about the STEAM slash STEM lab that was donated and how one of the things that's really a big push or movement, I think nationwide, is that we um, try to advance ourselves with science and technology and engineering and math. We speak a lot about the math and we speak a lot about reading, um, but I know as a district, I think we've invested a lot in STEAM slash STEM. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we really kind of hear how we're doing with that. I don't expect that tonight. Um, but I am really curious, you know, kind of how we're doing with that because another portion of that is that we're about to go ahead and spend money again in all the schools, making sure that the facilities are really kind of updated to meet whatever that is that we're looking for as an outcome. And um, one of the things I'm also very curious about, which is why I always ask about science, is because it's part of this STEAM slash STEM. And I'm really curious to kind of hear how we're doing with that um, because we also worked really, really hard on Portrait of a Graduate and part of that was critical thinking and I would think that that's where we would see that come out of and STEM slash STEM. So overall, again, I don't expect you to have a, a, a really detailed or in-depth answer on it, but I am curious kind of how are we doing with STEM slash STEM? wheel, the, the center circle I see is steam and all the cogs coming off of it are the different subject matters mm -hmm. because it envelops so much of what we do. It kind of, while it's a one space that the children go to for an hour a week, yes, but the things that are done in that space and the things that they learn aren't just learned there or done there, they're done everywhere. So that's why I kind of think it's here and then all the cogs of the wheel kind of hold it all together, and then the wheel on the outside is probably the overall child or the educational process, the education, et cetera. So that's my, when you ask that question, kind of. Does that answer it? We can bring some information back yeah. to the board as well, I think. Um, <clears throat> a lot of exciting things happening in our STEAM programs, not only at the elementary level, but at Parker as well, where we use FUSE at the elementary, use uh, creative learning systems. So we can bring that information back. You know. Anecdotally, STEAM kind of showed itself to me when we were having that conversation about after school clubs and extracurriculars because the number of kids, regardless of gender, school, you name it, coding, artificial intelligence, you know, really focused on, you know, they want a robotics club at the elementary level where they can build robots and do all those sorts of things. We weren't, those aren't 
we weren't hearing those requests in the past. So I think, as Ms. Reich has shared, that steam as the center of the wheel has really kind of really exploded the the inquiry of the students, and now we're trying to respond to that. But we can certainly bring some general information back about the STEAM programs and you know, have a large conversation. Yeah, I, I, and, and thank you, because that's kind of what my point was. It's like, I, I as a parent, um, I know that there are a lot of activities that are going on with STEAM slash STEM. And I, again, just kind of looking at all this, it's not something that we, we talk about. Yeah. So it'd be good to just kind of Get there. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Mr. Thank you. Last but not least. Dr. Great. Isabelli, welcome. Uh, wrap you guys up on the presentations for the evening. So you weren't dressed evening. up as anything today? Today was all black day for Black History Month. Okay. Yes. I did not have a costume. I've been for following. Today. Yeah. I have <laughs> yeah. yes. so fun. I have one left. One costume left right. that's been yeah. bought so far. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, but welcome everybody. So to start off with climate and culture, like all of my colleagues, we used our five essential survey to kind of dig in at first. And so we really looked at that safety and connection piece. Um, part of the safety piece, we've been using the reset and reflect strategy. It's been going well with our students. Our major referrals have decreased, kind of giving the kids a chance to be like, I just need to step out. I just need that time to kind of calm, or I am gonna go do my think sheet. So our minors have increased a bit, which is what we thought we would see, where they're taking that time out, but then not having those bigger heightened issues. Um, I'm super excited about our Alpha Pups Mentoring Club. That has been going really, really well. I have to give a shout out to Kate Manaher, our fifth grade teacher, who sponsors that club. She has um, 25 mentor pups, and they are seeing 22 pups in need, five new ones today after our behavior day today, and they take time out, they kick the kids, um, students' day off. Let's talk about what are your goals for today. They make friend groups with them. They do role playing with the students. And so she meets once a week with them to talk about how you do peer mediation, and then teachers can sign up that they have a student in need who might need a peer mentor or even peers can go on their canvas and click their alpha pup button and say I would like an alpha pup to help me solve this student to student problem and so it's been really going well to hear them talk is really funny and they will talk about well my pup is not doing this and that so the leadership skills you see arising from this club have been tremendous. And again, like I said, today we just added five new pups to our club that will have mentors to help problem solve some situations and really connect. Um, our new students are in there too. So kids who haven't been at Western, you know, how is it here? What is the culture here? How do I make those new friends? Nice. And then also we added this year our Wolves in Bloom Award and it's kind of morphed a bit. So at our monthly PBIS assemblies, uh, we split them into pre-K through second and third through fifth because we're just too big to do one huge assembly and it helps us target those areas also for the pre-K through two kids versus the third through fifth graders and how our Wolves in Bloom Award, we still honor our leaders of the pack, they're our big students of the month, but now we're also celebrating the growth students have made and in the upper grades, the students vote for who gets the Wolf in Bloom Award in their individual classrooms and they have to say why. And so that's been kind of special to help them feel like, because still that leader of the pack is that top echelon, but showing the growth and celebrating each other. When we go into our instruction, the lesson framing that we started at the beginning of the year has worked seamlessly into the Marzano proficiency scale work that all of my colleagues have talked about. That has really been amazing, being able to dig in and see exactly what our students need and where they need it. Uh, the teachers are a lot more competent in knowing this is the skill we need to do. Um, especially in that math area, we're giving that pretest and seeing we already know this unit of study, we're not going to spend time on it. If I have a couple of kids who need it, I can pull them in that small group. So that's really been helping. They've been flex grouping every math pretest based on that unit skill they've been giving. And then our biggest next steps now is really, you know, having them articulate. Uh, like Mrs. McNeil Dobson said, being able to say, here's the exact proof of why I'm at that different level. So that's really where we're going on those next steps there. And of course, like they've all said, they want the ELA proficiency scales. So they're waiting <laughs> for those as well. The math for today has been going very well, making sure we're constantly doing that repetitive um, teaching of the skills. 
in third through fifth, we're now kind of supplementing that with the IAR practice. So it was kind of where can we fit one more thing? Well, the math for today was to keep rotating those skills. So now that the IAR practice is doing that, third through fifth is kind of shifting gears there, but K through two continues the math for today to make sure those skills are going there. And then we're even differentiating some of that math for today in their small groups. So they might be working on a higher level of the math for today if they need it, or making sure we get some of those other skills in if we're seeing that they're struggling in a certain area. We are tweaking our reading. Um, <clears throat> really, we were kind of using that RAS kids that we have through the district to find those reading levels. Um, now we're kind of looking at, we saw a lot of growth in our map, which I'll get into in our achievement gap. And so we're kind of tweaking what we're doing and not just using the reading levels with RAS kids, but really pulling into map and saying, what were the areas where are the students struggling with some of their questions? Which moves me into our achievement gap. Our big um, rock that we bit off for our school improvement plan was our win time, the what I need time, that intervention time. We knew we needed to do something differently with it because our data was not showing the growth at the two bookends of it, our tier three students and the tier four students. And so we really needed to dive into what can we do differently. And Who's our tier, tier four, four students are our accelerated students, the students that are performing above grade level expectations. So what it had previously looked like, as I talked about in the fall, but to jag your memory was, basically it was our tier three, tier two kids getting small group instruction, our ACE and enrichment kids getting some small group, and then everybody else just kind of here's independent work to do. What we did is we kind of blew that model up and we put a math time and a reading time and all hands on deck. So if there are nine staff members available at that grade level, we divide up 80 kids between nine people based on where they fall on their math writ bands. And then now in the winter, which our staff is very thankful to have brought back winter map, was not just looking at where they fell on the writ level proficiency, but then did they make the growth in the intervention we put them in? So we pulled up the other report and map that really shows their growth quadrants as well to match that, and then again, coupled with the classroom work. So our teachers really dug into that winter data to determine is the intervention working. With math, uh, we've seen some great growth because we're able to make those bands, the groups that really target those RIP bands. So now we're kind of looking at tweaking that for reading and not just looking at the reading level, but digging into what part of those different reading areas of MAP is it that our students need to work on? And then with kindergarten, basing their classroom work to also pull in the Ames Web assessment that they're given. We are really happy with how that is going and continue um, you know, to see that growth in that. So it's been a lot more movement and a lot more educating of parents too to be like, wait, I have a letter now that states my student is in an intervention. Yes, but it's tier one and really having those conversations with parents about what that means We've had a lot more movement in our interventions than we have in the past. And then the last thing I'm gonna talk about in the achievement gap is really our BLT, our building leadership team said, we want weekly PLC meetings. We had done it where they were twice a month. They meet every Wednesday, the whole school, and digs into that data. So looking at the proficiency scale work, looking at the reading assessments. Mrs. Ranko, our assistant principal, myself, can step away and they get started without, like if we're running to quick make sure we have a sub for somewhere, we walk in there and those data discussions are ready. And what's been really great to hear is after data came out, you could hear teachers saying, what are you doing in second grade? You had this much growth in both reading and math area. We're struggling with the reading area. Can you share with us what you're doing? So they're having those cross grade level um, conversations as well. They have their data out. Okay, let's look at this vocab. Um, they're very targeted meetings. And so I'm really happy with the work we've done towards our professional learning com communities that I know every Wednesday they're taking off, whether it's a 7.45 one or an eight o'clock one, they're in there, their data's out, and they're going to work to make use of that time. So we're really proud of the work and the growth we've made so far. Now it's keeping that foot on the accelerator and keeping up with what we're doing and keep pushing forward and just making sure the students connect everything that we're doing and how it's making them grow. Any questions? Question. So Unfortunately, like I said, when I see each of you guys, it reminds me of something that's different. I've got three Bs for you. Um, one is bullying. Um, before COVID, bullying really had taken the, the, the nation's spotlight by storm. Um, but I don't hear a lot about kind of how that's going. So this isn't really kind of directed at you. It's really kind of a more general question. Two is that um, 
for a while we were having fights on the buses and that was becoming quite an issue. And then three is the uh, last B is behavior. So for me, I, uh, those kind of things all seem to t kind of tie together. Um, and I'm wondering again, and thinking about Cam's question, what are some of the commonalities? I'm wondering, is that something that also might be impacting attendance? That's for every, all schools, not just Western Avenue. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Correct. You just happen to be standing. You just have, right. You just reminded me of it. That's all. I will say at least um, part of our Alpha Pups program in that was to help with some of those bullying pieces. Does it still exist? Yes, it still exists. That we really work on kids with how are we being mean, and we talk to them about you are being mean on purpose over and over again. We use that acronym with them. Um, so it is something that's just kind of molded into the behavior we work with. Um, their incidents. When I look at our behavior in general, their reactions, quick reactions, and that's what we work with kind of in general from K all the way to fifth grade is that you bumped me in the hallway, David, and instead of asking you, excuse me, you bumped me, I'm just hitting you back. Like, it wasn't on purpose because you're David and I'm Gina, it was because that was my quick reaction. And so that's kind of a lot of still that behavior is that quick responses and taking that time to step down which is what we've used our alpha pups for, which is what we've used the reset and reflect time for, and then those targeted PBIS meetings as well to still deal with that. I can speak to Western as far as our bus data, and I'm not sure. Um, we worked in conjunction, France done great with bringing bus drivers in and giving them training, and we give them our incentives we work on. We have not seen a lot of bus referrals our way. <laughs> um, as far as that, it's the student won't sit down, they're eating on the bus, they're very loud. And that, um, what was your other, you asked me about, oh, those, oh the behavior great. of the bullying. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so and, and Fran and, and Dana, I would love to hear your two cents on, especially with the buses and the bullying, and, and what, how are we doing with that? Again, Carolyn, yes, because I was definitely, yeah. it was a district wide, yeah. it wasn't mm -hmm. just at Western. Maybe we can bring that back. Yeah, we can bring that back. You know, anecdotally, bus issues are way down. <clears throat> it, Every now and then one will have to stop or, you know, make for kids to get quiet. We've had, you know, certainly at the beginning of the year, we'd have a bus or here or there turn around and go back to school to get a refresher on the expectations. Um, but we're, we're seeing the, the continuous use of our systemic programs around PBIS, CKH, where they focus on self-management, uh, particularly uh, self-awareness, you know, the skills that really kind of go into direct instruction on here's how you have a conflict, here's how you work through those feelings and all those different pieces. I think you're seeing the results that at Parker of what's happening at the elementary schools and kind of the multi-year consistent implementation of programs. We really do not, from a systemic point of view, we don't change direction on those pieces very often once we've, we've made a a theoretical decision and move forward and we're seeing the kind of the results of that so we, we can bring that information back but you know I, I think as Gina's kind of wrapped up and, and thank you um, with all the elementary principals and what's happening at our middle school the the focus on student data decreasing the distance between information that parents need and the information that the teachers have we're trying to shrink that giving students more ownership, but, and we've talked at this table a lot, we have to use what works. We know what works. And as, you know, Ursula shared, they were having additional PD on small group instruction. We know that's the next step at the junior high, middle school, still called the junior high. <laughs> but we know that's part of the evolution. And elementary teachers digging into data, elementary, yes, they are chomping at the bit to move on to those ELA performance standards because you can't argue with the achievement. The students, when they know what they're supposed to be able to do and they know where they are in relation to that and then they receive the appropriate instruction are responding very positively. We're excited to move forward to that. I would say the next lift is going to be a big lift as we move into the next part of the conversation which is really taking that conversation from the student level with the performance standards to families. Here's your child. Here's a, the list of skills that they should know and be able to do. Here's exactly what they can do. 
here's how we're going to get them from A to B, and here's what your role is in that. So when we talk about the, the attendance pieces or we talk about you know, learning in general, again, it's kind of that wraparound piece, teacher, student, family, kind of all focused on the same areas, but specifically on what that child needs as opposed to, hey, you got an A in reading. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what that means. Right. And, right? And I've given A's in reading, but I still don't know what it means in relation to the standards unless you have that next step. So that's really the kind of the evolution of our work that's going to be uh, the 24, 25 work, certainly into 25 and 26. And one of, the, one of the corrections that we had to make, that I had to make, um, just from a leadership perspective is providing the information to the building leaders sooner. So we've accelerated our work with all of the departments. So we have our initiatives set for next year. The principals are already wrestling with those, figuring out what they're going to look like from an operational perspective. We know how much professional development time we have, money, all those different things. We're working on those pieces now so that we can maximize our school improvement days that happen right after the, the school year ends, right at the beginning of June there as they're planning for next year. So really, I, you know, it was important that we brought the data tonight and also the school improvement plan updates because the work is absolutely happening. Um, there's, I would say there's probably some, some conference presentations in here when you look at what's happening across the schools in our district. This is work um, that, that's happening in districts that I would look to as our beacon for, from an achievement perspective, from a relationship perspective, from a belonging perspective. And so I'm really excited about the work that we're doing. Um, I know that our building principals are showing up, and I don't mean to exclude our assistant principals, but the work is happening and visiting those classrooms, all of this happens. The conversations between teachers and students and student to student, these are, these are all things that we can observe. These are the lead indicators that tell us whether or not we're, expect, we're going to get the data that we expect. Because when we do instructional visits, are there performance standards? When you ask a child, hey, what are you learning today? And can you do it? No? Okay, well, what are you going to do next? When that conversation increases in sophistication that we've observed over the last four or five months, I can tell that our data is going to improve because the students know what they're supposed to do they know what they're trying to get done. They know the strategies to use. Whether they can do that or not may be different, but that's a different place than we've been in the past. And so I'm really excited about the work that we're doing. And I'm, really, I'm looking forward to finishing the school year. Certainly anecdotally, we want all those experiences to be great, but the data has to show up as well. And right now it is. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone, for your hard work. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. The yeah. next item on the agenda is the e-learning debrief. Almost there. <laughs> well, <laughs> kind of. Kind of. Hi again. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, just a quick update following up from our previous conversation about our e-learning day experiences for our students. We know that we have a, another uh, e-learning day coming up on March 19th. Um, our previous two e-learning days were not planned. We, they were weather related. We didn't know they were coming. Uh, but just wanted to give a quick summary and follow up on some of the comments and, and discussion um, after our previous days. Um, just a quick review of our schedules. Our schedules uh, for e-learning are designed to be mostly synchronous, meaning teachers are teaching live on Zoom with students in front of them. Uh, and then there's a portion of the day that is intentionally dedicated so that students can uh, work independently. They can contact a teacher if they need to. Um, but just look, taking a look at the elementary schedule, this is our general elementary schedule from 8 to 12. Students are synchronous with their teachers. Our schools do a lot of different things, um, pushing specialists into Zoom meetings. Students still go to their specials classes like art, music, PE developing links for all of those. Um, and then, of course, lunch break, and then from 12.30 to 1.30, students have small group or independent time. And then additionally, on the, for the junior high, our periods alternate on our e-learning days, so students do not see all of their periods on one e-learning day. They are, again, synchronous with their teacher live on Zoom. Uh, the expectations for teachers is that they are logging in with their students, they are teaching lessons, uh, they are going about their instruction as 
much as possible as they would uh, if students were in the room with them. Uh, and then students also have that additional hour at the end of the day for independent learning time. Just some anecdotal feedback, uh, talking to teachers and, and talking with parents also. In general, I think we, we touched on it at the last meeting, teachers are very aware that they're making in the moment instructional decisions um, based on the participation in their Zoom meetings, based on who's having, you know, one teacher said, we've got six kids having tech issues at the same time, you make a different decision. And, um, but the, I, I think our teachers are all very clear on the expectations of, uh, that our, our days that we learning need to be as engaging as possible. We expect them to still follow the curriculum uh, and follow a structure for their students. Uh, we did have a chance to reflect on this and discuss with our administrators and asked all of our building administrators to uh, just do a check, a revisit of the expectations for e-learning uh, with all of their staffs in preparation for March 19th. Um, also, just uh, uh, expectations or, or just feedback about the expectations from parents. Parents want that clarity. It's been a long time uh, since parents were remote every day with their children, and so that's something we can absolutely do before the March 19th date. Parents want a little bit of information reminding them of what their student schedule is for e learning days, what they should do when they get up. No, they probably shouldn't still be in bed, but with the Chromebook on. You know, those things that um, were, were sort of pressed so hard on when we were fully remote. Uh, parents also need those reminders, so we will make sure to do that at each school. Uh, feedback also from parents around you know, not across the board, but just wanting to make sure that they, they're getting as much rigor as possible um, in, in the virtual setting. And that, you know, is, is, is always the expectation. It is going to look very different uh, in a first grade Zoom meeting than it's going to look in an eighth grade high school level algebra class Zoom meeting. Uh, but the expectation is that teachers are engaging students. I do want to note that our kindergarten and pre I'm sorry, preschool and kindergarten students are not expected to be synchronous or live on Zoom with their teachers uh, for the amount of time that our grades one through eight students are. Our pre-K and kindergarten students take packets home to complete and teachers send out a Zoom link if there is a device at home that the, our youngest learners are able to use to access the Zoom link. For pre-K, we reiterate it to our staff to do a, a 30 minute check-in, a uh, little bit of activity with your students and then let them work independently. For kindergarten, it's a minimum of one hour being live and synchronous with their teacher. What do, the, what do those teachers do when they're not teaching? Like, so if... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they are available to their students and to their parents if, if they need support. Um, Talking to teachers, there's a lot of support needed. There's there's sure. not a there's not a lot of downtime. Just parents are right? they're absolutely not just like checking out and I'm gonna go shopping. Absolutely, today. parents are emailing. Okay. Uh, they have questions. Okay. Parents need to join Zoom meetings to show something on the Canvas page. So I'm, I'm really confident that that time is being used in support sure. of our students. Absolutely. Looking at our e-learning day attendance. Uh, we said we would bring this back. Uh, we can see the percentages here for each of our schools, uh, ranging from 54% participation at Parker, and I'll, I'll discuss a little caveat for that, um, to 94% at Western Avenue. Uh, we, we do have to do a little bit further digging um, on the junior high side for our, our how we're monitoring and capturing attendance on the e-learning days. Uh, we saw a lot of, between the two days, a lot of variation between uh, kids coming for one period, kids coming for three periods, and so we just clarified the numbers here. We had 392 students who missed at least one day on our first, uh, it was January 12th, um, one period, I apologize and 359 students who missed at least one period on the next day. So we will work with Parker to clarify what we want those thresholds to be for a day of attendance. If you think back to this schedule, uh, they don't have a full schedule anyway. So uh, when I, I looked closely at the number of students who are missing at least two periods, 
it's half of the day. You know, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, <laughs> you're, you need to be present for most of the day to be counted as present. So we need to work further on just developing those thresholds. So do we mark absent if, let's say, I'm not there for first period and I come around for third, am I absent? Or how does that work? Yeah, th that's what we need to determine. Okay. Uh, it was it was not consistent across the board, so that's why we included the numbers. Uh, if our, our teachers are expected to take attendance for each period, um, the way we're calculating the overall absence percentages, uh, it was it was hard to tell who would be counted absent if they missed one period versus if they came for one and a half or... Are we bound by any ISBE laws or rulings or how, how do they dictate? Not really. It's, it's really, they needed to determine half of the day and half of the day is two periods. Okay. So, 54%. Yes. That ain't good. It's not, and so we, we need to dig deeper into that. Again, that's why we clarified what's behind that 54%. Again, we know we're, we're faced with an attendance issue in person at the junior high also, and we're working through that as well. Um, this, I, I wanted to add this clarification to the attendance on the e-learning days as well, because we know that there's a little bit more behind it, uh, but it, it is not good, and we certainly expect higher numbers uh, for our March 19th date, especially since we know in advance that those days are, that day is coming. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we had heard, uh, the numbers for the other schools look great. So yes. certainly, I think, uh, better than a, maybe I was anticipating or worried, sure. worried about, so thank you. Yep. Um, but we had heard, at least I've heard, that some teachers decided to send kids to go play in the snow. I'm sure, I assume we, yeah, we, we did investigate that. that. Yeah. We, we did look into that. Um, I, just in, to, to speak about it in, in general, um, I think teachers very well intentioned uh, post things to encourage students to enjoy themselves on their time off in the schedule and I think on social media that can get uh, mis misunderstood, maybe blown out of proportion. I think the other thing we have to keep in mind is that our pre-K and kindergarten students are not live with their teacher all day. Um, so when teachers post things and say, you know, in addition to doing, when the intention is, in addition to doing your e-learning day, I also hope you enjoy some time in the snow and, and be a, a child. Um, that was absolutely the intention behind it. But we, we did look into those. Well, I hope you're saying further. this time, I hope you enjoy learning about the voters booth as your parents go to vote. That's right. I'm sure that's Civic right. responsibility. That's right. Mm -hmm. sure. We yeah. will include that in the reminder I, to I parents about e I, didn't, I didn't see that one come. In Chicago, we could just tell them to vote. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> the last slide says. Oh, right. Thank you. <laughs> just put us back on the track. Uh, this is just a, a few notes as I'm, uh, again, collecting anecdotal information from our teachers about what kinds of activities are they doing on e-learning days. Across the board, teachers also said, I'm, I am plowing through my curriculum if I have my kids there because I need to make sure we don't get off course. And I think that really just also speaks to what our principals talked about. Just our teachers are very focused on what their, teacher, their students need to learn this year, as, as they always are, but there's just a renewed energy around it. Um, just some other, discuss other comments, class discussion, small group work, achieve 3,000 activities, work nicely, being able to monitor students' participation in those things using GoGuardian. Uh, all of those are just examples of things that our teachers said that they're doing. Just a little snapshot also of ways that our schools are uh, getting kids access to their specials classes, embedding those links into the Canvas pages, embedding the Zoom link into the Canvas pages. A lot of the uh, Canvas pages that I spot check, the Zoom link for e-learning is always there, which I think is really wise because um, students don't ever lose sight of that we could be remote and have to do school on the computer again. And so they just keep it there. I was happy to see that there was, um, my students said, you know, oh, we had the dean popped in, and they says, everyone's popping into rooms. 
randomly. Yes. So I think that's fantastic. Yeah, just a great uh, shout out. Thank you for that uh, to the Parker Deans. Um, they do a really good job of capturing all of the Zoom links for yeah. all of their grade level classes so that they can pop in and monitor and support. And you see those messages going around between the teachers and the deans. And it's, it's just great to see that level of support. 54%, right? I'm sorry? Yeah, 54%. Yeah, I don't have it in. It's more to them. Okay. Yeah. It will be higher for March 19th. Again, looking ahead, I think we talked about the things we'll do in preparation, clarifying expectations uh, to parents as well as to teachers, which we've already done that check, uh, really taking a close look at the attendance and the monitoring and the recording of attendance, It's particularly at the junior high level, uh, and just making sure that parents and teachers are crystal clear on the expectations for e-learning. Is March 19th the last one of this year? Schedule. Depends on the weather. Okay, so we might have some snow. Did you order a blizzard? Nope. Okay. Well, I think it's a great time to just say, great job yes. responding to Thank our you. questions. Thank you. Secondly, I think your instructional team, excellent job. You've presented well. The amount of consistency that you all spoke from, I think is really challenging to be able to achieve across buildings to say, hey, this is what we're gonna get better at. And then all of us can speak to the nuances of how we're getting better at a thing, which is really around student advocacy and agency at obviously different developmental levels, but it's still present. Um, just congratulations. And it's a late day and just thank you for being here and presenting and just everything that you do. I, Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, team. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Oh, yeah. It's just a special ed and the preschool staff. Yeah, absolutely. So building staff, thank you so much. We know it's late. The kids are showing up at 730 no matter what, though. Goodbye. Thank you. That part. <laughs> we'll be here. We will miss you, but we'll carry the water in your absence. Yeah. Okay, the next item. <laughs> <laughs> on the agenda, we're still in the discussion items, Our, uh, let's see, special education and preschool staffing. All right. So currently, we have two social workers that are funded through the ESSER funds. In looking at, uh, we know that those funds are leaving us in September. As we look at planning and continue to support our early childhood students, our pre-K and early childhood students, one of those full-time positions really does focus mostly on push-in services, parent education, um, providing lessons within the classroom at the pre-K level. So the ask is that we are um, recommending to the board that we would add a, actually it's retaining a 1.0 social worker that would be part of our uh, pre-K program that would serve those children that are in that program. So we currently have funding for 110 students and we are pretty much full right now and are expecting to be full, um, pretty much at least 50% full um, as we're moving forward with students. Sorry, I'm getting very tired, excuse That's me. Right. Why? Okay. Sit, sit over here. Sit, sit okay, over here. all right, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm rambling a, a moment there. So that's the first ask that we're asking for. And then looking at our special education numbers of our instructional students in grades K through one. We have had a large influx of students, as we have said, in our pre-K program, and now they are turning um, five. So they need to move on to kindergarten, and um, some of them are not quite ready yet for that general education setting. We have quite a few students that are on the autism spectrum, and they are needing additional supports. And right now, looking at programming for them, we want to be able to provide that within the district. So the ask is that we would have an additional special education teacher, so we would have two K-1 instructional classrooms. We have 21 students right now that are slated for that placement. Students coming up from first grade that are already in our program, and then students coming from up from early childhood, which again is our special education self-contained class at the pre-K level. The ISBE guidance is that we can only have 13 students with a pair of professionals, so right now we could not 
serve all those children in one K-1 instructional classroom um, because of mandates. And it's not best practice either. So this social worker is separate from the ones we already have. No, this is the, so it is retaining the two that are split, or I'm sorry, between retaining the, the one, right, that is split between two buildings. So what we're asking for is the ESSER funds we were able to hire okay. two additional. Those two additional social workers are split between Serena Hills and Heather. And then we also have a social worker position that is split between Flossmoor Hills and Western Avenue. Okay. Right now, a large, a good portion of that time is spent in the preschool classrooms. So now that we're, we are technically losing those, we're not, we don't have the funding for both of them right. for next school year, we do need to retain at least one of them so that we can provide those services for our pre-K students. So it would be funded from pre-K for all grant and IDEA. Yes. So we're gonna be down a social worker? Okay, that's I was yes. trying. I, I, see, I was using my fingers, yes. and I, so I was trying yeah. to follow. And I, I okay. think I follow where Chris was so, going. Right, one social worker for four buildings. So each building has one full-time social worker. Okay, and Thanks. Parker has three. Okay, so technically we would be down one social worker for next school year. Not down one social worker. We're not recommending necessarily that that second ESSER position be retained. We're just asking for the one, which then that money will come out of IDEA and out of our pre-K for all grant. Okay. So it'll still be grant funded, the but ESSER. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. But we want to so one you had one, yes. then with ESSER, you added two more. We had 0.5 additional. So, so you had one and one? Okay. All right. I'm gonna be fine with it. I'm just trying to understand whether we're asking for right. one, one, yes. one more, or one that's the same, or we had two and we're losing so one. So one more um, before we had the ESSER funds. So technically, yes. I told you. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna drop it. I guess I'm not clear. <laughs> I'm trying. So no, I want to make it clear for it. So we will. I mean, go ahead, Haley. Go ahead. Yes. Bring one back. That's you want to bring back one. And so it looks like it's budgeted for. It's budgeted grants. within the so grant. This won't be an additional cost. No. <clears throat> Thank you. The additional right. costs come so on. So we're the losing next two yes. and we're gaining one back. See, I'm yes. losing two. Exactly. Say, say, yes. say it again. Yes. We're losing two, but we're getting one back. Exactly. That's Do you what, need one or you need two? <laughs> we need one. Okay. I'm good. Okay. There we go. So the next position, <laughs> the K-1 <laughs> instructional teacher, we do need an additional 0 0.1, no, 1.0. One 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 point point oh. Point oh. One. Yes, <laughs> one. Uh, we do need an additional um, Full special time. education one instructional. So no subtraction, just add one. Just add one, okay. right. And that will have to come out of local funds. Okay. However, it is mandated through the state sure. that we would need to have that in because the um, class numbers would be too high otherwise. So this is Fran's where Fran. Find the money anyways, so. Yeah, Fran. Yes. This yeah, is you don't think we brought this without Fran oh, is yeah. her magic yeah. right now, and it's poof. But, it's all in the okay. but great. this is great money to invest because we have to service those kids. Yes. And either, right. If we don't service them with one of our teachers, then we're paying. Forty thousand dollars per child yes. to go to an out-of-district placement. Right. You can see all those. Well, we also don't want to be out of compliance. Exactly. No, we don't. Exactly, and, and, that's, and that's we have the best outcomes two. with our kids and programs here. We're down two, we only get one. Do we, do we need the two? That's, that's all back to that same question. Uh, it was wonderful to have as a principal with the ESSER funds, mm -hmm. but yeah. with the ESSER funds going away, there has to be some cuts, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're able to meet all the minutes of students and meet all students' needs by letting the two go and keeping the one. Because that's what I'm really trying to get at. Right, and we did yeah. look at that. The preschool program would be an area that there would be a gap. In Parker service. was down so one, though, that. right? Correct. 
Okay. Then it's just staying the same. We're going to fill those and that will be. Okay. 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 Then the last area that we're looking at is increasing the 0.5 speech pathologists that we have right now. We actually, well, now this is going to get confusing. So we did actually <laughs> increase the 0.5 special or um, 0.5 speech pathologist to a point to a full time position, a one FTE. And right now we are contracting that speech pathologist to fulfill all those minutes within our pre K program. So what we're asking that we will just continue to have that uh, full time speech pathologist and that also will be 0.5 funded from local, which has already been budgeted in, and then the other half would be through IDEA. Now, will we try to hire our own mm -hmm. instead yes, of Yes, we're first? trying to hire okay. our own, and making it a full-time position will be a lot more, it'll be just a better way sure. for us instead to Instead of a staffing to, company. We can't, to, we can't uh, just hire the contract person and make them full-time? We can't I'm because sorry. we have contracts. She's really wonderful, but yeah, we have contracts where we have a certain amount of time between being hired within the district and contracting, so okay, I was, we can't. I was just getting basic. Okay. Yeah, right. we would be stealing that. We gotta try that. We actually have, I think it'll be okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, including personnel report 24-012? So moved. Second. Any questions? Roll call. Rose? Yes. Eduardo? Yes. Childress? Yes. Oh yes. 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 Yes, and the motion passes. Okay, the next set of items are the action items. Do I have to really read all the bid packages? Yes. Mm. Okay. <laughs> May I have a motion to approve the summer of 2024 bid packages as follows. Bid package number one, A1 group totaling 282,282. Hundred, I can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. <laughs> two eight no two hundred and eighty two hundred. I can't do it. All right. May, may I have a motion? I got it. May I have a motion to approve the summer of 2024 bid package as follows. Bid package number one, A1 group, totaling two hundred and eighty two thousand four hundred dollars, including alternate. Bid package number two. Mom and Corp totaling $454,999, including alternate. Bid package number three, SG Metal and Glass totaling $271,972, including alternate. Bid package number four, the YMI Group Inc. totaling $988,853, including alternate. And bid package number five, McWilliams Electric Company totaling $66,586. Second. Any questions? Yes. Fran, is, are there any changes to any of this? Thank you. This is the last time? No. Okay. This is the last time. Okay. That's it. Yes. Roll call. Aguara. Yeah. Nelson. Yes. 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 And the motion passes. May I have a motion to approve? Nope, we did that. Yay. May I have a motion to approve the expulsion abates agreement for student 2024D-2? So move. Second. Questions? Roll call? And, and, and we oh, whoops, sorry. Um, Dan, we discussed this in, in, in executive session. Yep. These no are, changes. Nope. Nope. These are good outcomes that um, put the students in a good situation moving forward. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes. Please drop. Yes. Nelson. Yes. 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 And the motion passes. May I have a motion to approve the expulsion abeyance agreement for for student 2024D-3. So moved. Second. Qu no, questions? Same question. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, nothing has changed. Nothing's changed. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Correct. Roll call. Nelson? Yes. 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 Um, and the motion passes. Are there any questions regarding the information items? Do we need executive we session? Not. Okay. Oh. They were placeholders. What's that? Pla they were placeholders. Okay. All right. Um, meeting. Oh, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? I'd like to stay. Aye. Aye. Meeting Perfect. adjourned at 1036.
Thanks, Liz. Thank Have you. a good day. Good night, Liz. I'm like, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I'm like, sure we didn't miss anything? I, I mean, we can throw. We go. David, I think David has one more question for everyone. <laughs> <laughs>